getting infected, she said, and they could sink. Sink? Into your flesh, into your bloodstream, and get carried to your heart or your brain. He seemed to believe her. He lay back and sighed at the distant ceiling. Bloody hell. I mean, excuse me, nurse. I don't think I'm up to it today. Let's count them up together, shall we? They did so, out loud. Eight. She pushed him gently in the chest. They've got to come out. Lie back now. I'll be as quick as I can. If it helps you, grip the bedhead behind you. His leg was tensed and trembling as she took the forceps. Don't hold your breath. Try and relax. He made a derisive snorting sound. <laughs> relax! She steadied her right hand with her left. It would have been easier for her to sit on the edge of the bed, but that was unprofessional and strictly prohibited. When she placed her left hand on an unaffected part of his leg, he flinched. She chose the smallest piece you could find on the edge of the cluster. The protruding part was obliquely triangular. She gripped it, paused a second, then pulled it clear, firmly but without jerking. Fuck! The escaped word ricocheted around the ward and seemed to repeat itself several times. There was silence, or at least a lowering of sound beyond the screens. Bryony still held the bloody metal fragment between her forceps. It was three-quarters of an inch long and narrowed to a point. Purposeful steps were approaching. She dropped the shrapnel into the kidney bowl as Sister Drummond whisked the screen aside. She was perfectly calm as she glanced at the foot of the bed to take in the man's name and presumably his condition. Then she stood over him and gazed into his face. How dare you, the sister said quietly. And then again, how dare you speak that way in front of one of my nurses? I beg your pardon, sister, it, it just came out. Sister Drummond looked with disdain into the bowl. Compared to what we've admitted these past few hours, Airman Young, your injuries are superficial. So you'll consider yourself lucky, and you'll show some courage worthy of your uniform. Carry on, Nurse Tallis. Into the silence that followed her departure, Bryony said brightly, We'll get on, shall we? Only seven to go. When it's over, I'll bring you a measure of brandy. He sweated, his whole body shook, and his knuckles turned white round the iron bedhead, but he did not make a sound as she continued to pull the pieces clear. You know, you can shout if you want. But he didn't want a second visit from Sister Drummond, and Bryony understood. She was saving the largest until last. It did not come clear in one stroke. He bucked on the bed and hissed through his clenched teeth. By the second attempt, the shrapnel stuck out two inches from his flesh. She tugged it clear on the third try and held it up for him, a gory four-inch stiletto of irregular steel. He stared at it in wonder. Run him under the tap, nurse. I'll take him home. Then he turned into the pillow and began to sob. It may have been the word home as well as the pain. She slipped away to get his brandy and stopped in the sluice to be sick. For a long time she undressed, washed and dressed the more superficial of the wounds. Then came the order she was dreading. I want you to go and dress Private Latimer's face. She'd already tried to feed him earlier with a teaspoon into what remained of his mouth, trying to spare him the humiliation of dribbling. He pushed her hand away. Swallowing was excruciating. Half his face had been shot away. What she dreaded more than the removal of the dressing was the look of reproach in his large brown eyes. What have you done to me? His form of communication was a soft ah sound from the back of his throat, a little moan of disappointment. We'll soon have you fixed, she kept repeating, and could think of nothing else. And now, approaching his bed with her materials, she said cheerily, Hello, Private Latimer, it's me again. He looked at her without recognition. She said as she unpinned the bandage that was secured at the top of his head, It's going to be all right. You walk out of here in a week or two, you'll see. And that's more than we can say to a lot of them in here. That was one comfort. There was always someone worse. Half an hour earlier they had carried out a multiple amputation on a captain from the East Surreys, the regiment the boys in the village had joined. And then there were the dying. Using a pair of surgical tongs, 
she began carefully pulling away the sodden, congealed lengths of ribbon gauze from the cavity in the side of his face. When the last was out, the resemblance to the cutaway model they used in anatomy classes was only faint. This was all ruin, crimson and raw. She could see through his missing cheek to his upper and lower molars and the tongue glistening and hideously long. Further up, where she hardly dared look, were the exposed muscles around his eye socket, so intimate and never intended to be seen. Private Latimer had become a monster, and he must have guessed this was so. Did a girl love him before? Could she continue to? We'll soon have you fixed, she lied again. She began repacking his face with clean gauze soaked in usol. As she was securing the pins, he made his sad sound. Shall I bring you the bottle? He shook his head and made the sound again. You're uncomfortable? No. Water? A nod. Only a small corner of his lips remained. She inserted the little teapot spout and poured. With each swallow he winced, which in turn caused him agony around the missing muscles of his face. He could stand no more, but as she withdrew the water pot he raised a hand towards her wrist. He had to have more, rather pain than thirst. And so it went on for minutes. He couldn't bear the pain. He had to have the water. She would have stayed with him, but there was always another job, always a sister demanding help or a soldier calling from his bed. She had a break from the wards when a man coming round from an anaesthetic was sick onto her lap and she had to find a clean apron. She was surprised to see from a corridor window that it was dark outside. Five hours had passed since they came back from the park. She was by the linen store tying her apron when Sister Drummond came up. It was hard to say what had changed. The manor was still quietly remote, the orders unchallengeable, perhaps beneath the self-discipline, a touch of rapport in adversity. Nurse, you'll go and help apply the bunion bags to Corporal McIntyre's arms and legs. You'll treat the rest of his body with tannic acid. If there are difficulties, you'll come straight to me. She turned away to give instructions to another nurse. Bryony had seen them bring the corporal in. He was one of a number of men overwhelmed by burning oil on a sinking ferry off Dunkirk. He was picked out of the water by a destroyer. The viscous oil clung to the skin and seared through the tissue. It was the burned-out remains of a human they lifted onto the bed. She thought he could never survive. It was not easy to find a vein to give him morphine. Sometime in the past two hours she'd helped two other nurses lift him onto a bedpan, and he had screamed at the first touch of their hands. The bunion bags were big cellophane containers. The damaged limb floated inside, cushioned by saline solution that had to be at exactly the right temperature. A variation of one degree was not tolerated. As Briony came up, a probationer with a primer stove on a trolley was already preparing the fresh solution. The bags had to be changed frequently. Corporal McIntyre lay on his back under a bed cradle because he could not bear the touch of a sheet on his skin. He was whimpering pathetically for water. Burn cases were always badly dehydrated. His lips were too ruined, too swollen, and his tongue too blistered for him to be given fluid by mouth. His saline drip had come away, the needle would not hold in place in the damaged vein. A qualified nurse she'd never seen before was attaching a new bag to the stand. Bryony prepared the tannic acid in a bowl and took the roll of cotton wool. She thought she would start with the corporal's legs, in order to be out of the way of the nurse who was beginning to search his blackened arm looking for a vein. But the nurse said, who sent you over here? Sister Drummond. The nurse spoke tersely and did not look up from her probing. He's suffering too much. I don't want him treated until I get him hydrated. Go and find something else to do. Briony did as she was told. She did not know how much later it was, perhaps it was in the small hours, when she was sent to get fresh towels. She saw the nurse standing near the entrance to the duty room, unobtrusively crying. Corporal McIntyre was dead. His bed was already taken by another case. The probationers and the second-year students worked twelve hours without rest. The other trainees and the qualified nurses worked on, and no one could remember how long they were in the wards. All the training she had received, Bryony felt later, had been useful preparation, especially in obedience. But everything she understood about nursing, she learned that night.
She'd never seen men crying before. It shocked her at first, and within the hour she was used to it. On the other hand, the stoicism of some of the soldiers amazed and even appalled her. Men coming round from amputation seemed compelled to make terrible jokes. What am I going to kick the missus with now? Every secret of the body was rendered up. Bone risen through flesh, sacrilegious glimpses of an intestine or an optic nerve. From this new and intimate perspective, she learned a simple, obvious thing she'd always known, and everyone knew, that a person is, among all else, a material thing, easily torn, not easily mended. She came the closest she would ever be to the battlefield, for every case she helped with had some of its essential elements, blood, oil, sand, mud, seawater, bullets, shrapnel, engine grease, or the smell of cordite, or damp, sweaty battle dress whose pockets contained rancid food, along with the sodden crumbs of ammo bars. Often, when she returned yet again to the sink with the high taps and the soda block, it was beach sand she scrubbed away from between her fingers. She and the other probationers of her set were aware of each other only as nurses, not as friends. She barely registered that one of the girls who had helped to move Corporal McIntyre onto the bedpan was Fiona. Sometimes, when a soldier Bryony was looking after was in great pain, she was touched by an impersonal tenderness that detached her from the suffering, so that she was able to do her work efficiently and without horror. That was when she saw what nursing might be, and she longed to qualify, to have that badge. She could imagine how she might abandon her ambitions of writing and dedicate her life in return for these moments of elated, generalised love. Towards 3.30 in the morning, she was told to go and see Sister Drummond. She was on her own, making up a bed. Earlier, Bryony had seen her in the sluice room. She seemed to be everywhere, doing jobs at every level. Automatically, Bryony began to help her. The sister said, I seem to remember that you speak a bit of French. Well, it's only school French, sister. She nodded towards the end of the ward. You see that soldier sitting up at the end of the row? Acute surgical. But there's no need to wear a mask. Find a chair, go and sit with him. Hold his hand and talk to him. Briny could not help feeling offended. But I'm not tired, sister. Honestly, I'm not. You'll do as you're told. Yes, sister. He looked like a boy of fifteen, but she saw from his chart that he was her own age, eighteen. He was sitting, propped by several pillows, watching the commotion around him with a kind of abstracted, childlike wonder. It was hard to think of him as a soldier. He had a fine, delicate face, with dark eyebrows and dark green eyes, and a soft, full mouth. His face was white and had an unusual sheen, and the eyes were unhealthily radiant. His head was heavily bandaged. As she brought up her chair and sat down, he smiled as though he'd been expecting her, and when she took his hand, he did not seem surprised. « Te voilà enfin !» The French vowels had a musical twang, but she could just about understand him. His hand was cold and greasy to the touch. She said, The sister told me to come and have a little chat with you. Not knowing the word, she translated sister literally. Your sister is very kind. Then he cocked his head and added, But she always was. And is all going well for her? What does she do these days? There was such friendliness and charm in his eyes, such boyish eagerness to engage her, that she could only go along. She's a nurse, too. Of course, you told me before. Is she still happy? Did she get married to that man she loved so well? If you know I can't remember his name, I hope you'll forgive me. Since my injury, my memory has been poor, but they tell me it will soon come back. What was his name? Robbie. But... And they're married now and happy? Um, I hope they will be soon. I'm so happy for her. You haven't told me your name. Luc. Luc Cornet. And yours? She hesitated. Talis. Talis. That's very pretty. The way he pronounced it, it was. He looked away from her face and gazed at the ward, turning his head slowly, quietly amazed. Then he closed his eyes and began to ramble, speaking softly under his breath. 
Her vocabulary was not good enough to follow him easily. She caught, you count them slowly, in your hand, on your fingers. My mother's scarf. You chose the color, and you have to live with it. He fell silent for some minutes. His hand tightened its grip on hers. When he spoke again, his eyes were still closed. Do you want to know something odd? This is my first time in Paris. Luke, you're in London. Soon we'll be sending you home. They said that the people would be cold and unfriendly. But the opposite is true. They're very kind. And you're very kind coming to see me again. For a while she thought he might have fallen asleep. Sitting for the first time in hours, she felt her own fatigue gathering behind her eyes. Then he was looking about him with that same slow turn of the head. And then he looked at her and said, Of course, you are the girl with the English accent. She said, Tell me what you did before the war. Where did you live? Can you remember? Do you remember that Easter when you came to Milo? Feebly he swung her hand from side to side as he spoke, as though to stir her memory, and his dark green eyes scanned her face in anticipation. She thought it wasn't right to lead him on. I've never been to Milo. Do you remember the first time you came in our shop? She pulled her chair nearer the bed. His pale, oily face gleamed and bobbed in front of her eyes. Luke, I want you to listen to me. I think it was my mother who served you. Or perhaps it was one of my sisters. I was working with my father on the ovens at the back. I heard your accent and came to take a look at you. I want to tell you where you are. You're not in Paris. Then you were back the next day. And this time I was there. And you said, soon you can sleep. I'll come and see you tomorrow, I promise. Luke raised his hand to his head and frowned. He said in a lower voice, I want to ask you a little favor, Talis. Of course. These bandages are so tight. Will you loosen them for me a little? She stood and peered down at his head. The gauze bows were tied for easy release. As she gently pulled the ends away, he said, My younger sister Anne, do you remember her? She's the prettiest girl in Milo. She passed her great exam with a tiny piece by Debussy, so full of light and fun. Anyway, that's what Anne says. It keeps running through my mind. Perhaps you know it. He hummed a few random notes. She was uncoiling the layer of gauze. No one knows where she got her gift from. The rest of our family is completely hopeless. When she plays, her back is so straight. She never smiles till she reaches the end. That's beginning to feel better. I think it was Anne who served you that first time you came into the shop. She was not intending to remove the gauze, but as she loosened it, the heavy sterile towel beneath it slid away, taking a part of the bloody dressing with it. The side of Luke's head was missing. The hair was shaved well back from the missing portion of skull. Below the jagged line of bone was a spongy crimson mess of brain, several inches across, reaching from the crown almost to the tip of his ear. She caught the towel before it slipped to the floor, and she held it while she waited for her nausea to pass. Only now did it occur to her what a foolish and unprofessional thing she'd done. Luke sat quietly waiting for her. She glanced down the ward. No one was paying attention. She replaced the sterile towel, fixed the gauze, and retied the bows. When she sat down again, she found his hand and tried to steady herself in its cold, moist grip. Luke was rambling again. I don't smoke. I promised my Russian to Jeanne. Look, it's all over the table, under the flowers now. The rabbits can't hear you, stupid. Then words came in a torrent and she lost him. Later she caught a reference to a schoolmaster who was too strict, or perhaps it was an army officer. Finally he was quiet. She wiped his sweating face with a damp towel and waited. When he opened his eyes, he resumed their conversation as though there had been no interlude. What did you think of our baguettes and vicelles? 
Delicious. That was why you came every day. Yes. He paused to consider this. Then he said cautiously, raising a delicate matter, And our croissant? The best in Milo. He smiled. When he spoke, there was a grating sound at the back of his throat, which they both ignored. It's my father's special recipe. It all depends on the quality of butter. He was gazing at her in rapture. He brought his free hand to cover hers. He said, You know that my mother is very fond of you. Is she? She talks about you all the time. She thinks we should be married in the summer. She held his gaze. She knew now why she'd been sent. He was having difficulty swallowing, and drops of sweat were forming on his brow along the edge of the dressing and along his upper lip. She wiped them away and was about to reach the water for him, but he said, Do you love me? She hesitated. Yes. No other reply was possible. Besides, for that moment she did. He was a lovely boy who was a long way from his family, and he was about to die. She gave him some water. While she was wiping his face again, he said, Have you ever been on the coast of Larzac? No, I've never been there. But he did not offer to take her. Instead, he turned his head away into the pillow, and soon he was murmuring his unintelligible scraps. His grip on her hand remained tight as though he were aware of her presence. When he became lucid again, he turned his head towards her. You won't leave. Just yet. Of course not. I'll stay with you. Talise. Still smiling, he half closed his eyes. Suddenly, he jerked upright as if an electric current had been applied to his limbs. He was gazing at her in surprise with his lips parted. Then he tipped forwards and seemed to lunge at her. She jumped up from her chair to prevent him toppling to the floor. His hand still held hers, and his free arm was around her neck. His forehead was pressed into her shoulder. His cheek was against hers. She was afraid the sterile towel would slip from his head. She thought she could not support his weight or bear to see his wound again. The grating sound from deep in his throat resounded in her ear. Staggering, she eased him onto the bed and settled him back on the pillows. It's Bryony, she said, so only he would hear. His eyes had a wide-open look of astonishment, and his waxy skin gleamed in the electric light. She moved closer and put her lips to his ear. Behind her was a presence, and then a hand resting on her shoulder. It's not Talis. You should call me Bryony, she whispered, as the hand reached over to touch hers and loosened her fingers from the boys. Stand up now, Nurse Talis. Sister Drummond took her elbow and helped her to her feet. The sister's cheek patches were bright, and across the cheekbones the pink skin met the white in a precise straight line. On the other side of the bed, a nurse drew the sheet over Luc Cornet's face. Pursing her lips, the sister straightened Bryony's collar. There's a good girl. Now go and wash the blood from your face. We don't want the other patients upset. She did as she was told, and went to the lavatories and washed her face in cold water, and minutes later returned to her duties in the ward. At 4.30 in the morning, the probationers were sent to their lodgings to sleep, and told to report back at eleven. Bryony walked with Fiona. Neither girl spoke, and when they linked arms, it seemed they were resuming, after a lifetime of experience, their walk across Westminster Bridge. They could not have begun to describe their time in the wards or how it had changed them. It was enough to be able to keep walking down the empty corridors behind the other girls. When she'd said her good nights and entered her tiny room, Bryony found a letter on the floor. The handwriting on the envelope was unfamiliar. One of the girls must have picked it up at the porter's lodge and pushed it under her door. Rather than open it straight away, she undressed and prepared herself for sleep. She sat on her bed in her nightdress with a letter in her lap and thought about the boy. The corner of sky in her window was already white. She could still hear his voice, the way he said, Talise, turning it into a girl's name. <laughs>
she imagined the unavailable future. The boulangerie in a narrow, shady street, swarming with skinny cats. Piano music from an upstairs window. A giggling sisters-in-law teasing her about her accent. And Luc Cornet loving her in his eager way. She would have liked to cry for him, and for his family in Milo, who would be waiting to hear news from him. But she couldn't feel a thing. She was empty. She sat for almost half an hour in a daze, and then, at last, exhausted, but still not sleepy, she tied her hair back with the ribbon she always used, got into bed, and opened the letter. Dear Miss Tallis, thank you for sending us two figures by a fountain, and please accept our apologies for this dilatory response. As you must know, it would be unusual for us to publish a complete novella by an unknown writer, or, for that matter, a well-established one. However, we did read with an eye to an extract we might take. Unfortunately, we are not able to take any of it. I am returning the typescript under separate cover. That said, we found ourselves, initially against our better judgment, for there is much to do in this office, reading the whole with great interest. Though we cannot offer to publish any part of it, we thought you should know that in this quarter there are others, as well as myself, who would take an interest in what you might write in the future. We are not complacent about the average age of our contributors and are keen to publish promising young writers. We would like to see whatever you do, especially if you were to write a short story or two. We found Two Figures by a Fountain arresting enough to read with dedicated attention. I do not say this lightly. We cast aside a great deal of material, some of it by writers of reputation. There are some good images... I liked the long grass stalked by the leonine yellow of high summer, and you both capture a flow of thought and represent it with subtle differences in order to make attempts at characterization. Something unique and unexplained is caught. However, we wondered whether it owed a little too much to the techniques of Mrs. Wolfe. The crystalline present moment is, of course, a worthy subject in itself, especially for poetry, it allows a writer to show his gifts, delve into mysteries of perception, present a stylized version of thought processes, permit the vagaries and unpredictability of the private self to be explored, and so on. Who can doubt the value of this experimentation? However, such writing can become precious when there is no sense of forward movement. Put the other way round, our attention would have been held even more effectively had there been an underlying pull of simple narrative. Development is required. So, for example, the child at the window, whose account we read first, her fundamental lack of grasp of the situation is nicely caught. So, too, is the resolve in her that follows, and the sense of initiation into grown-up mysteries. We catch this young girl at the dawn of her selfhood. One is intrigued by her resolve to abandon the fairy stories and homemade folk tales and plays she's been writing, how much nicer if we had the flavour of one, but she may have thrown the baby of fictional technique out with the folktale water. For all the fine rhythms and nice observations, nothing much happens after a beginning that has such promise. A young man and woman by a fountain, who clearly have a great deal of unresolved feeling between them, tussle over a Ming vase and break it. More than one of us here thought Ming rather too priceless to take outdoors. Wouldn't Sèvres or Nymphenburg suit your purpose? The woman goes fully dressed into the fountain to retrieve the pieces. Wouldn't it help you if the watching girl did not actually realise that the vase had broken? It would be all the more of a mystery to her that the woman submerges herself. So much might unfold from what you have, but you dedicate scores of pages to the quality of light and shade and to random impressions. Then we have matters from the man's view, then the woman's, though we don't really learn much that is fresh just more about the look and feel of things and some irrelevant memories. The man and woman part, leaving a damp patch on the ground which rapidly evaporates, and there we have reached the end. This static quality does not serve your evident talent well. If this girl has so fully misunderstood or been so wholly baffled by the strange little scene that has unfolded before her, how might it affect the lives of the two adults? Might she come between them in some disastrous fashion, or bring them closer, either by design or accident? 
Might she innocently expose them somehow to the young woman's parents, perhaps? They surely would not approve of a liaison between their eldest daughter and their charlady's son. Might the young couple come to use her as a messenger? In other words, rather than dwell for quite so long on the perceptions of each of the three figures, would it not be possible to set them before us with greater economy, still keeping some of the vivid writing about light and stone and water, which you do so well, but then move on to create some tension, some light and shade within the narrative itself? Your most sophisticated readers might be well up on the latest Bergsonian theories of consciousness, but I'm sure they retain a childlike desire to be told a story, to be held in suspense, to know what happens. Incidentally, from your description, the Bernini you refer to is the one in the Piazza Barberini, not the Piazza Navona. Simply put, you need the backbone of a story. It may interest you to know that one of your avid readers was Mrs. Elizabeth Bowen, she picked up the bundle of typescript in an idle moment while passing through this office on her way to luncheon, asked to take it home to read, and finished it that afternoon. Initially, she thought the prose too full, too cloying, but with redeeming shades of dusty answer, which I wouldn't have thought of at all. Then she was hooked for a while, and finally she gave us some notes, which are, as it were, mulched into the above. You may feel perfectly satisfied with your pages as they stand, or our reservations may fill you with dismissive anger, or such despair you never want to look at the thing again. We sincerely hope not. Our wish is that you will take our remarks, which are given with sincere enthusiasm, as a basis for another draft. Your covering letter was admirably reticent, but you did hint that you had almost no free time at present. If that should change, and you are passing this way, we would be more than happy to see you over a glass of wine and discuss this further. We hope you will not be discouraged. It may help you to know that our letters of rejection are usually no more than three sentences long. You apologise in passing for not writing about the war. We will be sending you a copy of our most recent issue with a relevant editorial. As you will see, we do not believe that artists have an obligation to strike up attitudes to the war. Indeed, they are wise and right to ignore it and devote themselves to other subjects. Since artists are politically impotent, they must use this time to develop at deeper emotional levels. Your work, your war work, is to cultivate your talent and go in the direction it demands. Warfare, as we remarked, is the enemy of creative activity. Your address suggests that you may be either a doctor or suffering from a long illness. If the latter, then all of us wish you a speedy and successful recovery. Finally, one of us here wonders whether you have an older sister who was at Girton six or seven years ago. Your sincerely, C.C. In the days that followed, the reversion to a strict shift system dispelled the sense of floating timelessness of those first twenty-four hours. She counted herself lucky to be on days, seven till eight, with half hours for meals. When her alarm sounded at 5.45, she drifted upwards from a soft pit of exhaustion and in the several seconds of no man's land between sleep and full consciousness, she became aware of some excitement in store, a treat or a momentous change. Waking as a child on Christmas Day was like this, the sleepy thrill before remembering its source. With her eyes still closed against the summer morning brightness in the room, she fumbled for the button on her clock and sank back into her pillow. And then it came back to her. The very opposite of Christmas, in fact. The opposite of everything. The Germans were about to invade. Everybody said it was so, from the porters who were forming their own hospital local defence volunteers unit, to Churchill himself, who conjured an image of the country subjugated and starving, with only the Royal Navy still at large. Brownie knew it would be dreadful, that there would be hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the streets and public hangings, a descent into slavery and the destruction of everything decent. But as she sat on the edge of her rumpled, still-warm bed, pulling on her stockings, she could not prevent or deny her horrible exhilaration. As everyone kept saying, the country stood alone now, and it was better that way. Already things looked different. The fleur-de-lis pattern on her wash bag, the chipped plaster frame of the mirror, her face in it as she brushed her hair, all looked brighter, in sharper focus. The doorknob in her hand as she turned it, 
felt obtrusively cool and hard. When she stepped into the corridor and heard distant heavy footsteps in the stairwell, she thought of German jackboots, and her stomach lurched. Before breakfast, she had a minute or two to herself along the walkway by the river. Even at this hour, under a clear sky, there was a ferocious sparkle in its tidal freshness as it slid past the hospital. Was it really possible that the Germans could own the Thames? The clarity of everything she saw or touched or heard was certainly not prompted by the fresh beginnings and abundance of early summer. It was an inflamed awareness of an approaching conclusion, of events converging on an end point. These were the last days, she felt, and they would shine in the memory in a particular way. This brightness, this long spell of sunny days, was history's last fling before another stretch of time began. The early morning duties, the sluice room, the taking round of tea, the changing of dressings and the renewed contact with all the irreparable damage, did not dim this heightened perception. It conditioned everything she did and was a constant background, and it gave an urgency to her plans. She felt she did not have much time. If she delayed, she thought, the Germans might arrive and she might never have another chance. Fresh cases arrived each day, but no longer in a deluge. The system was taking hold, and there was a bed for everyone. The surgical cases were prepared for the basement operating theatres. Afterwards, most patients were sent off to outlying hospitals to convalesce. The turnover among the dead was high, and for the probationers there was no drama now, only routine. The screens drawn round the padre's bedside murmur, the sheet pulled up, the porters called, the bed stripped and remade. How quickly the dead faded into each other, so that Sergeant Mooney's face became Private Lowell's, and both exchanged their fatal wounds with those of other men whose names they could no longer recall. Now France had fallen, it was assumed that the bombing of London, the softening up, must soon begin. No one was to stay in the city unnecessarily. The sandbagging on the ground-floor windows was reinforced, and civilian contractors were on the roofs, checking the firmness of the chimney-stacks and the concreted skylights. There were various rehearsals for evacuating the wards, with much stern shouting and blowing of whistles. There were fire drills, too, and assembly point procedures, and fitting gas masks on incapable or unconscious patients. The nurses were reminded to put their own masks on first. They were no longer terrorised by Sister Drummond. Now they had been blooded, she did not speak to them like schoolgirls. Her tone, when she gave instructions, was cool, professionally neutral, and they were flattered. In this new environment, it was relatively easy for Bryony to arrange to swap her day off with Fiona, who generously gave up her Saturday for a Monday. Because of an administrative bungle, some soldiers were left to convalesce in the hospital. Once they had slept off their exhaustion and got used to regular meals again, and regained some weight, the mood was sour or surly, even among those without permanent disabilities. They were infantrymen, mostly. They lay on their beds, smoking, silently staring at the ceiling, brooding over their recent memories. Or they gathered to talk in mutinous little groups. They were disgusted with themselves. A few of them told Bryony they had never even fired a shot. But mostly they were angry with the brass, and with their own officers for abandoning them in the retreat, and with the French for collapsing without a fight. They were bitter about the newspaper celebrations of the miracle evacuation and the heroism of the little boats. The fucking shambles, she heard them mutter. Fucking RAF. Some men were even unfriendly and uncooperative about their medicines, having managed to blur the distinction between the generals and the nurses. All mindless authority as far as they were concerned. It took a visit from Sister Drummond to set them straight. On Saturday morning, Bryony left the hospital at eight without eating breakfast and walked with the river on her right upstream. As she passed the gates of Lambeth Palace, three buses went by. All the destination boards were blank now, confusion to the invader. It did not matter because she had already decided to walk. It was of no help that she had memorised a few street names, all the signs had been taken down or blacked out. Her vague idea was to go along the river a couple of miles and then head off to the left, which should be south. Most plans and maps of the city had been confiscated by order. Finally, she had managed to borrow a crumbling bus route map 
dated 1926. It was torn along its folds, right along the line of the way she wanted to take. Opening it was to risk breaking it in pieces, and she was nervous of the kind of impression she would make. There were stories in the paper of German parachutists, disguised as nurses and nuns, spreading out through the cities and infiltrating the population. They were to be identified by the maps they might sometimes consult, and, on questioning, by their too perfect English and their ignorance of common nursery rhymes. Once the idea was in her mind, she could not stop thinking about how suspicious she looked. She thought her uniform would protect her as she crossed unknown territory. Instead, she looked like a spy. As she walked against the flow of morning traffic, she ran through the nursery rhymes she remembered. There were very few she could have recited all the way through. Ahead of her, a milkman had got down from his cart to tighten the girth straps of his horse. He was murmuring to the animal as she came up. Briefly, there came back to her as she stood behind him and politely cleared her throat, a memory of old Hardman and his trap. Anyone who was, say, seventy now would have been her age in 1888, still the age of the horse, at least on the streets, and the old men hated to let it go. When she asked him the way, the milkman was friendly enough and gave a long, indistinct account of the route. He was a large fellow with a tobacco-stained white beard. He suffered from an adenoidal problem that made his words bleed into each other through a humming sound in his nostrils. He waved her towards a road forking to the left, under a railway bridge. She thought it might be too soon to be leaving the river. But as she walked on, she sensed him watching her and thought it would be impolite to disregard his directions. Perhaps the left fork was a shortcut. She was surprised by how clumsy and self-conscious she was after all she'd learned and seen. She felt inept, unnerved by being out on her own and no longer part of her group. For months she'd lived a closed life whose every hour was marked on a timetable. She knew her humble place in the ward. As she became more proficient in the work, so she became better at taking orders and following procedures and ceasing to think for herself. It was a long time since she'd done anything on her own. Not since her week in Primrose Hill typing out the novella. And what a foolish excitement that seemed now. She was walking under the bridge as a train passed overhead. The thunderous, rhythmic rumble reached right into her bones. Steel gliding and thumping over steel, the great bolted sheets of it high above her in the gloom. An inexplicable door sunk into the brickwork, mighty cast-iron pipework clamped in rusting brackets and carrying no one knew what. Such brutal invention belonged to a race of supermen. She herself mopped floors and tied bandages. Did she really have the strength for this journey? When she stepped out from under the bridge, crossing a wedge of dusty morning sunlight, the train was making a harmless, clicking suburban sound as it receded. What she needed, Bryony told herself yet again, was backbone. She passed a tiny municipal park with a tennis court on which two men in flannels were hitting a ball back and forwards, warming up for a game with lazy confidence. There were two girls in khaki shorts on a bench nearby, reading a letter. She thought of her letter, a sugar-coated rejection slip. She'd been carrying it in her pocket during her shift, and the second page had acquired a crab-like stain of carbolic. She had come to see that, without intending to, it delivered a significant personal indictment. Might she come between them in some disastrous fashion? Yes, indeed. And having done so, might she obscure the fact by concocting a slight, barely clever fiction and satisfy her vanity by sending it off to a magazine? The interminable pages about light and stone and water, a narrative split between three different points of view, the hovering stillness of nothing much seeming to happen, none of this could conceal her cowardice. Did she really think she could hide behind some borrowed notions of modern writing and drown her guilt in a stream, three streams, of consciousness? The evasions of her little novel were exactly those of her life. Everything she did not wish to confront was also missing from her novella and was necessary to it. What was she to do now? It was not the backbone of a story that she lacked. It was backbone. She left the little park behind and passed a small factory whose thrumming machinery made the pavement vibrate. 
There was no telling what was being made behind those high, filthy windows, or why yellow and black smoke poured from a single slender aluminium stack. Opposite, set in a diagonal across a street corner, the wide-open double doors of a pub suggested a theatre stage. Inside, where a boy with an attractive, pensive look was emptying ashtrays into a bucket, last night's air still had a bluish look. Two men in leather aprons were unloading beer barrels down a ramp from the dray cart. She'd never seen so many horses on the streets. The military must have requisitioned all the lorries. Someone was pushing open the cellar trap doors from inside. They banged against the pavement, sending up the dust, and a man with a tonsure, whose legs were still below street level, paused and turned to watch her go by. He appeared to her like a giant chess piece. The draymen were watching her too, and one of them wolf-whistled. All right, darling. She didn't mind, but she never knew how to reply. Yes, thank you. She smiled at them all, glad of the folds of her cape. Everyone, she assumed, was thinking about the invasion. But there was nothing to do but keep on. Even if the Germans came, people would still play tennis or gossip or drink beer. Perhaps the wolf-whistling would stop. As the street curved and narrowed, the steady traffic along it sounded louder and the warm fumes blew into her face. A Victorian terrace of bright red brick faced right onto the pavement. A woman in a paisley apron was sweeping with demented vigour in front of her house, through whose open door came the smell of fried breakfast. She stood back to let Bryony pass, for the way was narrow here. But she looked away sharply at Bryony's good morning. Approaching her were a woman and four jug-eared boys with suitcases and knapsacks. The kids were jostling and shouting and kicking along an old shoe. They ignored their mother's exhausted cry as Bryony was forced to stand aside and let them pass. Leave off, will ya? Let the nurse see through. As she passed, the woman gave a lopsided smile of rueful apology. Two of her front teeth were missing. She was wearing a strong perfume and between her fingers she carried an unlit cigarette. They're so excited about going in the countryside. Never been before, would you believe? Bryony said. Good luck. I hope you get a nice family. The woman, whose ears also protruded, but were partially obscured by her hair cut in a bob, gave a gay shout of a laugh. Ha! I don't know what they're in for with this lot. She came at last to a confluence of shabby streets which she assumed from the detached quarter of her map, was Stockwell. Commanding the route south was a pillbox, and standing by it with only one rifle between them was a handful of bored home guards. An elderly fellow in a trilby, overalls and armband with drooping jowls like a bulldog's, detached himself and demanded to see her identity card. Self-importantly, he waved her on. She thought better of asking him directions. As she understood it, her way lay straight along the Clapham Road for almost two miles. There were fewer people here and less traffic, and the street was broader than the one she'd come up. The only sound was the rumble of a departing tram. By a line of smart Edwardian flats, set well back from the road, she allowed herself to sit for half a minute on a low parapet wall in the shade of a plane tree and remove her shoe to examine a blister on her heel. A convoy of three-ton lorries went by, heading south, out of town. Automatically, she glanced at their backs, half expecting to see wounded men, but there were only wooden crates. Forty minutes later, she reached Clapham Common tube station. A squat church of rumpled stone turned out to be locked. She took out her father's letter and read it over again. A woman in a shoe shop pointed her towards the common. Even when Bryony had crossed the road and walked onto the grass, she did not see the church at first. It was half concealed among trees in leaf, and was not what she expected. She had been imagining the scene of a crime, a Gothic cathedral whose flamboyant vaulting would be flooded with brazen light of scarlet and indigo from a stained-glass backdrop of lurid suffering. What appeared among the cool trees as she approached was a brick barn of elegant dimensions, like a Greek temple with a black-tiled roof, windows of plain glass, and a low portico with white columns beneath a clock tower of harmonious proportions. Parked outside, close to the portico, was a polished black Rolls-Royce. The driver's door was ajar, but there was no chauffeur in sight. 
As she passed the car, she felt the warmth of its radiator, as intimate as body heat, and heard the click of contracting metal. She went up the steps and pushed on the heavy studded door. The sweet, waxy smell of wood, the watery smell of stone, were of churches everywhere. Even as she turned her back to close the door discreetly, she was aware that the church was almost empty. The vicar's words were in counterpoint with their echoes. She stood by the door, partly screened by the font, waiting for her eyes and ears to adjust. Then she advanced to the rear pew and slid along to the end, where she still had a view of the altar. She had been to various family weddings, though she was too young to have been at the grand affair in Liverpool Cathedral of Uncle Cecil and Aunt Hermione, whose form and elaborate hat she could now distinguish in the front row. Next to her were Piero and Jackson, lankier by five or six inches, wedged between the outlines of their estranged parents. On the other side of the aisle were three members of the Marshall family. This was the entire congregation. A private ceremony, no society journalists. Bryony was not meant to be there. She was familiar enough with the form of words to know that she had not missed the moment itself. Secondly, it was ordained for a remedy against sin and to avoid fornication that such persons as have not the gift of continency might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of Christ's body. Facing the altar, framed by the elevated, white-sheeted shape of the vicar, stood the couple. She was in white, the full traditional wear and as far as Bryony could tell from the rear, was heavily veiled. Her hair was gathered into a single childish plait that fell from under the froth of tulle and organdy and lay along the length of her spine. Marshall stood erect, the lines of his padded morning suit shoulders etched sharply against the vicar's surplice. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help and comfort that the one ought to have of the other. She felt the memories the needling details like a rash, like dirt on her skin. Lola coming to her room in tears, her chafed and bruised wrists, and the scratches on Lola's shoulder and down Marshall's face. Lola's silence in the darkness at the lakeside, as she let her earnest, ridiculous, oh-so-prim younger cousin who couldn't tell real life from the stories in her head, deliver the attacker into safety. Poor, vain and vulnerable Lola, with the pearl-studded choker and the rose-water scent, who longed to throw off the last restraints of childhood, who saved herself from humiliation by falling in love, or persuading herself she had, and who could not believe her luck when Bryony insisted on doing the talking and blaming. And what luck that was for Lola, barely more than a child, prized open and taken, to marry her rapist. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not be lawfully joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter for ever hold his peace. Was it really happening? Was she really rising now, with weak legs and empty contracting stomach and stuttering heart, and moving along the pew to take her position in the centre of the aisle, and setting out her reasons, her just causes, in a defiant, untrembling voice as she advanced in her cape and headdress like a bride of Christ, towards the altar, towards the open-mouthed vicar, who had never before in his long career been interrupted, towards the congregation of twisted necks and the half-turned, white-faced couple. She had not planned it, but the question, which she had quite forgotten from the Book of Common Prayer, was a provocation. And what were the impediments exactly? Now was her chance to proclaim in public all the private anguish and purge herself of all that she had done wrong before the altar of this most rational of churches. But the scratches and bruises were long healed, and all her own statements at the time were to the contrary. Nor did the bride appear to be a victim, and she had her parents' consent. More than that, surely, a chocolate magnet, the creator of ammo, Aunt Hermione would be rubbing her hands. But Paul Marshall, Lola Quincy, and she, Bryony Tallis, had conspired with silence and falsehoods to send an innocent man to jail. But the words that had convicted him had been her very own, read out loud on her behalf in the county court. The sentence had already been served. The debt was paid. The verdict stood. She remained in her seat, 
with her accelerating heart and sweating palms, and humbly inclined her head. I require and charge you both, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts will be disclosed, that if either of you know of any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, you do now confess it. By any estimate, it was a very long time until judgment day, and until then the truth that only Marshall and his bride knew at first hand was steadily being walled up within the mausoleum of their marriage. There it would lie, secure in the darkness, long after anyone who cared was dead. Every word in the ceremony was another brick in place. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Bird-like, Uncle Cecil stepped up smartly, no doubt anxious to be done with his duty before hurrying back to the sanctuary of All Souls, Oxford. Straining to hear any wavering doubt in their voices, Bryony listened to Marshall, then Lola, repeating the words after the vicar. Marshall boomed expressionlessly. Lola was sweet and sure. How flagrantly, sensually it reverberated before the altar when she said, With my body... I thee worship. Let us pray. Then the six outlined heads in the front pews drooped, and the vicar removed his tortoiseshell glasses, lifted his chin, and with eyes closed addressed the heavenly powers in his weary, sorrowful sing-song. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, the last brick was set in place, as the vicar, having put his glasses back on, made the celebrated pronouncement, man and wife together, and invoked the trinity after which his church was named. There were more prayers, a psalm, the Lord's Prayer, and another long one in which the falling tones of valediction gathered into a melancholy finality. Pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul, and live together in holy love unto your life's end. Immediately there cascaded from the fluting organ confetti of skittering triplets as the vicar turned to lead the couple down the aisle and the six family members fell in behind. Bryony, who had been on her knees in a pretense of prayer, stood and turned to face the procession as it reached her. The vicar seemed a little pressed for time and was many feet ahead of the rest, when he glanced to his left and saw the young nurse, his kindly look and tilt of the head expressed both welcome and curiosity. Then he strode on to pull one of the big doors wide open. A slanting tongue of sunlight reached all the way to where she stood and illuminated her face and headdress. She wanted to be seen, but not quite so clearly. There would be no missing her now. Lola, who was on Bryony's side, drew level, and their eyes met. A veil was already parted. The freckles had vanished, but otherwise she was not much changed, only slightly taller, perhaps, and prettier, softer and rounder in the face, and the eyebrows severely plucked. Bryony simply stared. All she wanted was for Lola to know she was there and to wonder why. The sunlight made it harder for Bryony to see, but for a fraction of a moment a tiny frown of displeasure may have registered in the bride's face. Then she pursed her lips and looked to the front. And then she was gone. Paul Marshall had seen her too, but had not recognised her, and nor had Aunt Hermione or Uncle Cecil, who had not met her in years. But the twins, bringing up the rear in school uniform trousers at half-mast, were delighted to see her and mined mock horror at her costume and did cloudish eye-rolling yawns with hands flapping on their mouths. Then she was alone in the church with the unseen organist, who went on playing for his own pleasure. It was over too quickly, and nothing for certain was achieved. She remained standing in place, beginning to feel a little foolish, reluctant to go outside. Daylight and the banality of family small talk would dispel whatever impact she had made as a ghostly illuminated apparition. She also lacked courage for a confrontation. And how would she explain herself, the uninvited guest, to her uncle and aunt? They might be offended, or worse, they might not be, 
and want to take her off to some excruciating breakfast in a hotel with Mr. and Mrs. Paul Marshall, oily with hatred, and Hermione failing to conceal her contempt for Cecil. Bryony lingered another minute or two as though held there by the music, then, annoyed with her own cowardice, hurried out onto the portico. The vicar was a hundred yards off at least, walking quickly away across the common with arms swinging freely. The newlyweds were in the rolls, Marshall at the wheel, reversing in order to turn round. She was certain they saw her. There was a metallic screech as he changed gear, a good sign, perhaps. The car moved away, and through a side window she saw Lola's white shape huddled against the driver's arm. As for the congregation, it had vanished completely among the trees. She knew from her map that Balaam lay at the far end of the common, in the direction the vicar was walking. It was not very far, and this fact alone made her reluctant to continue. She would arrive too soon. She'd eaten nothing, she was thirsty, and her heel was throbbing, and had glued itself to the back of her shoe. It was warm now, and she would be crossing a shadeless expanse of grass, broken by straight asphalt paths and public shelters. In the distance was a bandstand where men in dark blue uniforms were milling about. She thought of Fiona, whose day off she had taken, and of their afternoon in St. James's Park. It seemed a far-off, innocent time, but it was no more than ten days ago. Fiona would be doing the second bedpan round by now. Bryony remained in the shade of the portico and thought about the little present she would buy her friend, something delicious to eat, a banana, oranges, Swiss chocolate. The porters knew how to get these things. She'd heard them say that anything, everything was available if you had the right money. She watched the file of traffic moving round the common, along her route, and she thought about food. Slabs of ham, poached eggs, the leg of a roast chicken, thick Irish stew, lemon meringue, a cup of tea. She became aware of the nervy, fidgeting music behind her the moment it ceased, and in the sudden new measure of silence, which seemed to confer freedom, she decided she must eat breakfast. There were no shops that she could see in the direction she had to walk, only dull mansion blocks of flats in deep orange brick. Some minutes passed, and the organist came out, holding his hat in one hand and a heavy set of keys in the other. She would have asked him the way to the nearest café, but he was a jittery-looking man at one with his music, who seemed determined to ignore her as he slammed the church door shut and stooped over to lock it. He rammed his hat on and hurried away. Perhaps this was the first step in the undoing of her plans, but she was already walking back, retracing her steps in the direction of Clapham High Street. She would have breakfast, and she would reconsider. Near the tube station she passed a stone drinking trough and could happily have sunk her face in it. She found a drab little place with smeared windows and cigarette butts all over the floor, but the food could be no worse than what she was used to. She ordered tea and three pieces of toast and margarine and strawberry jam of palest pink. She heaped sugar into the tea, having diagnosed herself as suffering from hypoglycemia. The sweetness did not quite conceal a taste of disinfectant. She drank a second cup, glad that it was lukewarm so she could gulp it down. Then she made use of a reeking, seatless lavatory across a cobbled courtyard behind the café. But there was no stench that could impress a trainee nurse. She wedged lavatory paper into the heel of her shoe. It would see her another mile or two. A hand basin with a single tap was bolted to a brick wall. There was a grey-veined lozenge of soap she preferred not to touch. When she ran the water, the waste fell straight out onto her shins. She dried them with her sleeves and combed her hair, trying to imagine her face in the brickwork. However, she couldn't reapply her lipstick without a mirror. She dabbed her face with a soaked handkerchief and patted her cheeks to bring up the colour. A decision had been made without her, it seemed. This was an interview she was preparing for, the post of beloved younger sister. She left the café and as she walked along the common, she felt the distance widen between her and another self, no less real, who was walking back towards the hospital. Perhaps the Bryony who was walking in the direction of Balaam was the imagined or ghostly persona. This unreal feeling was heightened when, after half an hour, she reached another high street, more or less the same as the one she'd left behind. That was all London was beyond its centre. 
an agglomeration of dull little towns, she made a resolution never to live in any of them. The street she was looking for was three turnings past the tube station, itself another replica. The Edwardian terraces, net-curtained and seedy, ran straight for half a mile. Forty-three Dudley Villas was halfway down, with nothing to distinguish it from the others, except for an old Ford 8 without wheels supported on brick piles, which took up the whole of the front garden. If there was no one in, she could go away, telling herself she'd tried. The doorbell did not work. She let the knocker fall twice and stood back. She heard a woman's angry voice, then the slam of a door and the thud of footsteps. Brownie took another pace back. It was not too late to retreat up the street. There was a fumbling with a catch and an irritable sigh, and the door was opened by a tall, sharp-faced woman in her thirties, who was out of breath from some terrible exertion. She was in a fury. She'd been interrupted in a row and was unable to adjust her expression, the mouth open, the upper lip slightly curled, as she took Bryony in. "'What do you want?' "'I'm looking for a Miss Cecilia Tallis. Her shoulders sagged, and she turned her head back as though recoiling from an insult. She looked Bryony up and down. "'You look like her.' Bewildered, Bryony simply stared at her. The woman gave another sigh that was almost like a spitting sound and went along to the foot of the stairs. "'Tallis!' she yelled. "'Door!' She came halfway back along the corridor to the entrance to her sitting room, flashed Bryony a look of contempt, then disappeared, pulling the door violently behind her. The house was silent. Bryony's view past the open front door was of a stretch of floral lino and the first seven or eight stairs, which were covered in deep red carpet. The brass rod on the third step was missing. Halfway along the hall was a semicircular table against the wall, and on it was a polished wooden stand like a toast rack for holding letters. It was empty. The lino extended past the stairs to a door with a frosted glass window which probably opened onto the kitchen out the back. The wallpaper was floral too, a posy of three roses alternating with a snowflake design. From the threshold to the beginning of the stairs, she counted fifteen roses, sixteen snowflakes. Inauspicious. At last she heard a door opening upstairs, possibly the one she'd heard slammed when she'd knocked. Then the creak of a stair, and feet wearing thick socks came into view, and a flash of bare skin and a blue silk dressing gown that she recognised. Finally, Cecilia's face tilting sideways as she leaned down to make out who was at the front door and spare herself the trouble of descending further, improperly dressed. It took her some moments to recognise her sister. She came down slowly, another three steps. Oh, my God! She sat down and folded her arms. Bryony remained standing with one foot still on the garden path, the other on the front step. A wireless in the landlady's sitting room came on, and the laughter of an audience swelled as the valves warmed. There followed a comedian's wheedling monologue, broken at last by applause, and a jolly band striking up. Brownie took a step into the hallway. She murmured, I have to talk to you. Cecilia was about to get up, then changed her mind. Why didn't you tell me you were coming? You didn't answer my letter. So I came. She drew her dressing gown around her and patted its pocket, probably in the hope of a cigarette. She was much darker in complexion, and her hands too were brown. She had not found what she wanted, but for the moment she did not make to rise. Marking time rather than changing the subject, she said, You're a probationer? Yes. Whose ward? Sister Drummond's. There was no telling whether Cecilia was familiar with his name or whether she was displeased that her younger sister was training at the same hospital. There was another obvious difference. Cecilia had always spoken to her in a motherly or condescending way. Little sis. No room for that now. There was a hardness in her tone that warned Bryony off asking about Robbie. She took another step further into the hallway, conscious of the front door open behind her. And where are you? Near Morden. It's an EMS. An emergency medical services hospital, a commandeered place, most likely dealing with the brunt, the real brunt of the evacuation. 
There was too much that couldn't be said, or asked. The two sisters looked at each other. Even though Cecilia had the rumpled look of someone who just got out of bed, she was more beautiful than Bryony remembered her. That long face always looked odd and vulnerable. Horsey, everyone said, even in the best of lights. Now it looked boldly sensual, with an accentuated bow of the full purplish lips. The eyes were dark and enlarged, by fatigue perhaps, or sorrow. The long, fine nose, the dainty flare of the nostrils, there was something mask-like and carved about the face, and very still, and hard to read. Her sister's appearance added to Bryony's unease, and made her feel clumsy. She barely knew this woman whom she hadn't seen in five years. Bryony could take nothing for granted. She was searching for another neutral topic, but there was nothing that did not lead back to the sensitive subjects, the subjects she was going to have to confront in any case, and it was because she could no longer bear the silence and the staring that she said at last, Have you heard from the old man? No, I haven't. The downward tone implied she didn't want to, and wouldn't care or reply if she did. Cecilia said, have you? I had a scribbled note a couple of weeks ago. Good. So there was no more to be said on that. After another pause, Bryony tried again. What about from home? No, I'm not in touch. And you? She writes now and then. And what's her news, Bryony? The question and the use of her name was sardonic. As she forced her memory back, she felt she was being exposed as a traitor to her sister's cause. They've taken in evacuees, and Betty hates them. The park's been ploughed up for corn. She trailed away. It was inane to be standing there, listing these details. But Cecilia said coldly, Go on. What else? Well, most of the lads in the village have joined the East Surreys, Except for, except for Danny Hardman, yes, I know all about that. She smiled in a bright, artificial way, waiting for Bryony to continue. They've built a pillbox by the post office, and they've taken up all the old railings. Um, Aunt Hermione's living in Nice, and, uh, oh yes, Betty broke Uncle Clem's vase. Only now was Cecilia roused from her coolness. She uncrossed her arms and pressed a hand against her cheek broke. She dropped it on a step. You mean properly broken, in lots of pieces? Yes. Cecilia considered this. Finally, she said, that's terrible. Yes, Bryony said. Poor Uncle Clem. At least her sister was no longer derisive. The interrogation continued. Did they keep the pieces? I don't know. Emily said the old man shouted at Betty. At that moment, the door snapped open and the landlady stood right in front of Bryony, so close to her that she could smell peppermint on the woman's breath. She pointed at the front door. This isn't a railway station. Either you're in, young lady, or you're out. Cecilia was getting to her feet without any particular hurry and was retying the silk cord of her dressing gown. She said languidly, This is my sister Bryony, Mrs Jarvis. Try and remember your manners when you speak to her. In my own home, I'll speak as I please, Mrs Jarvis said. She turned back to Bryony. Stay if you're staying, otherwise leave now and close the door behind you. Bryony looked at her sister, guessing that she was unlikely to let her go now. Mrs Jarvis had turned out to be an unwitting ally. Cecilia spoke as though they were alone. Don't mind the landlady, I'm leaving at the end of the week. Close the door and come up. Watched by Mrs Jarvis, Bryony began to follow her sister up the stairs. And as for you, Lady Muck, the landlady called up. But Cecilia turned sharply and cut her off. Enough, Mrs Jarvis. Now that's quite enough. Bryony recognised the tone. Pure nightingale for use on difficult patients or tearful students. It took years to perfect. Cecilia had surely been promoted to ward sister. On the first floor landing, as she was about to open her door, she gave Bryony a look a cool glance to let her know that nothing had changed, nothing had softened. From the bathroom across the way, through its half-open door, drifted a humid, scented air and a hollow dripping sound. 
Cecilia had been about to take a bath. She led Bryony into her flat. Some of the tidiest nurses on the ward lived in stews in their own rooms, and she would not have been surprised to see a new version of Cecilia's old chaos. But the impression here was of a simple and lonely life. A medium-sized room had been divided to make a narrow strip of a kitchen, and presumably a bedroom next door. The walls were papered with a design of pale vertical stripes, like a boy's pyjamas, which heightened the sense of confinement. The lino was irregular offcuts from downstairs, and in places grey floorboard showed. Under the single sash window was a sink with one tap and a one-ring gas cooker. Against the wall, leaving little room to squeeze by, was a table covered with a yellow gingham cloth. On it was a jam jar of blue flowers, harebells perhaps, and a full ashtray, and a pile of books. At the bottom were Gray's Anatomy and a collected Shakespeare, and above them, on slenderer spines, names in faded silver and gold, she saw Houseman and Crab. By the books were two bottles of stout. In the corner furthest from the window was the door to the bedroom, on which was tacked a map of Northern Europe. Cecilia took a cigarette from a packet by the cooker, and then, remembering that her sister was no longer a child, offered one to her. There were two kitchen chairs by the table, but Cecilia, who leaned with her back to the sink, did not invite Bryony to sit down. The two women smoked, and waited, so it seemed to Bryony, for the air to clear of the landlady's presence. Cecilia said in a quiet, level voice, "'When I got your letter, I went to see a solicitor. "'It's not straightforward unless there's hard, new evidence. "'Your change of heart won't be enough. "'Lola will go on saying she doesn't know. "'Our only hope was old Hardman, and now he's dead.' "'Hardman? "'The contending elements, the fact of his death, "'his relevance to the case, confused Bryony, "'and she struggled with her memory. "'Was Hardman out that night looking for the twins?' Did he see something? Was something said in court that she didn't know about? Didn't you know he was dead? No, but unbelievable. Cecilia's attempts at a neutral, factual tone were coming apart. Agitated, she came away from the cooking area, squeezed past the table and went to the other end of the room and stood by the bedroom door. Her voice was breathy as she tried to control her anger. How odd that Emily didn't include that in her news, along with the corn and the evacuees. He had cancer. Perhaps with the fear of God in him, he was saying something in his last days that was rather too inconvenient for everyone at this stage. But see, she snapped, don't call me that. She repeated it in a softer voice. Please don't call me that. Her fingers were on the handle of the bedroom door, and it looked like the interview was coming to an end. She was about to disappear. With an implausible display of calm, she summarised for Bryony. What I paid two guineas to discover is this. There isn't going to be an appeal just because five years on you've decided to tell the truth. I don't understand what you're saying. Bryony wanted to get back to Hardman, but Cecilia needed to tell her what must have gone through her head many times lately. It isn't difficult. If you were lying then, why should a court believe you now? There are no new facts, and you're an unreliable witness. Bryony carried her half-smoked cigarette to the sink. She was feeling sick. She took a saucer for an ashtray from the plate rack. Her sister's confirmation of her crime was terrible to hear. But the perspective was unfamiliar. Weak, stupid, confused, cowardly, evasive, she'd hated herself for everything she'd been, but she'd never thought of herself as a liar. How strange, and how clear it must seem to Cecilia. It was obvious, and irrefutable, and yet for a moment she even thought of defending herself. She hadn't intended to mislead, she hadn't acted out of malice. But who would believe that? She stood where Cecilia had stood, with her back to the sink, and, unable to meet her sister's eyes, said, What I did was terrible. I don't expect you to forgive me. Don't worry about that, she said soothingly, and in the second or two during which she drew deeply on her cigarette, Bryony flinched as her hopes lifted unreally. Don't worry, her sister resumed. 
I won't ever forgive you. And if I can't go to court, that won't stop me telling everyone what I did. As her sister gave a wild little laugh, Bryony realised how frightened she was of Cecilia. Her derision was even harder to confront than her anger. This narrow room, with its stripes like bars, contained a history of feeling that no one could imagine. Bryony pressed on. She was, after all, in a part of the conversation she had rehearsed. I'll go to Surrey and speak to Emily and the old man. I'll tell them everything. Yes, you said that in your letter. What's stopping you? You've had five years. Why haven't you been? I wanted to see you first. Cecilia came away from the bedroom door and stood by the table. She dropped her stub into the neck of a stout bottle. There was a brief hiss, and a thin line of smoke rose from the black glass. Her sister's action made Bryony feel nauseous again. She thought the bottles were full. She wondered if she'd ingested something unclean with her breakfast. Cecilia said, I know why you haven't been, because your guess is the same as mine. They don't want to hear anything more about it. That unpleasantness is all in the past, thank you very much. What's done is done. Why stir things up now? And you know very well they believed Hardman's story. Bryony came away from the sink and stood right across the table from her sister. It was not easy to look into that beautiful mask. She said, very deliberately, I don't understand what you're talking about. What's he got to do with this? I'm sorry he's dead. I'm sorry I didn't know. At a sound, she started. The bedroom door was opening, and Robbie stood before them. He wore army trousers and shirt and polished boots, and his braces hung free at his waist. He was unshaven and tousled, and his gaze was on Cecilia only. She turned to face him, but she did not go towards him. In the seconds during which they looked at each other in silence, Bryony, partly obscured by her sister, shrank into her uniform. He spoke to Cecilia quietly as though they were alone. I heard voices, and I guessed it was something to do with the hospital. That's all right. He looked at his watch. Better get moving. As he crossed the room, just before he went out onto the landing, he made a brief nod in Bryony's direction. Excuse me. They heard the bathroom door close. Into the silence, Cecilia said, as if there were nothing between her and her sister. He sleeps so deeply, I didn't want to wake him. Then she added, I thought it would be better if you didn't meet. Bryony's knees were actually beginning to tremble. Supporting herself with one hand on the table, she moved away from the kitchen area so that Cecilia could fill the kettle. Bryony longed to sit down. She would not do so until invited, and she would never ask. So she stood by the wall, pretending not to lean against it, and watched her sister. What was surprising was the speed with which her relief that Robbie was alive was supplanted by her dread of confronting him. Now she'd seen him walk across the room, the other possibility, that he could have been killed, seemed outlandish, against all the odds. It would have made no sense. She was staring at her sister's back as she moved about the tiny kitchen. Brownie wanted to tell her how wonderful it was that Robbie had come back safely, what deliverance, but how banal that would have sounded, and she had no business saying it. She feared her sister and her scorn. Still feeling nauseous and now hot, Bryony pressed her cheek against the wall. It was no cooler than her face. She longed for a glass of water, but she did not want to ask her sister for anything. Briskly, Cecilia moved about her tasks, mixing milk and water to egg powder and setting out a pot of jam and three plates and cups on the table. Bryony registered this, but it gave her no comfort. It only increased her foreboding of the meeting that lay ahead. Did Cecilia really think that in this situation they could sit together and still have an appetite for scrambled eggs? Or was she soothing herself by being busy? Bryony was listening out for footsteps on the landing, and it was to distract herself that she attempted a conversational tone. She'd seen the cape hanging on the back of the door. Cecilia, are you a ward sister now? Yes, I am. She said it with a downward finality, closing off the subject. Their shared profession was not going to be a bond. Nothing was, and there was nothing to talk about until Robbie came back. At last, 
she heard the click of the lock on the bathroom door. He was whistling as he crossed the landing. Brownie moved away from the door, further down towards the darker end of the room, but she was in his sightline as he came in. He'd half raised his right hand in order to shake hers, and his left trailed, about to close the door behind him. If it was a double take, it was undramatic. As soon as their eyes met, his hands dropped to his sides, and he gave a little winded sigh as he continued to look at her hard. However intimidated, she felt she could not look away. She smelled the faint perfume of his shaving soap. The shock was how much older he looked, especially round the eyes. Did everything have to be her fault? she wondered stupidly. Couldn't it also be the wars? So it was you, he said finally. He pushed the door closed behind him with his foot. Cecilia had come to stand by his side and he looked at her. She gave an exact summary, but even if she'd wanted, she would not have been able to withhold her sarcasm. Bryony's going to tell everybody the truth. She wanted to see me first. He turned back to Bryony. Did you think I might be here? Her immediate concern was not to cry. At that moment, nothing would have been more humiliating. Relief, shame, self-pity. She didn't know which it was, but it was coming. The smooth wave rose, tightening her throat, making it impossible to speak. And then, as she held on, tensing her lips, it fell away, and she was safe. No tears, but her voice was a miserable whisper. I didn't know if you were alive. Cecilia said, If we're going to talk, we should sit down. I don't know that I can. He moved away impatiently to the adjacent wall, a distance of seven feet or so, and leaned against it, arms crossed, looking from Bryony to Cecilia. Almost immediately he moved again, down the room to the bedroom door, where he turned to come back, changed his mind, and stood there, hands in pockets. He was a large man, and the room seemed to have shrunk. In the confined space he was desperate in his movements, as though suffocating. He took his hands from his pockets and smoothed the hair at the back of his neck. Then he rested his hands on his hips. Then he let them drop. It took all this time, all this movement, for Bryony to realise that he was angry, very angry. And just as she did, he said, What are you doing here? Don't talk to me about Surrey. No one's stopping you going. Why are you here? She said, I had to talk to Cecilia. Oh, yes, and what about? The terrible thing that I did. Cecilia was going towards him. Robbie, she whispered. Darling. She put her hand on his arm, but he pulled it clear. I don't know why you let her in. Then to Bryony. I'll be quite honest with you. I'm torn between breaking your stupid neck here and taking you outside and throwing you down the stairs. If it had not been for her recent experience, she would have been terrified. Sometimes she heard soldiers on the ward raging against their helplessness. At the height of their passion, it was foolish to reason with them or try to reassure them. It had to come out, and it was best to stand and listen. She knew that even offering to leave now could be provocative. So she faced Robbie and waited for the rest, her due. But she was not frightened of him, not physically. He did not raise his voice, though it was straining with contempt. Have you any idea at all? what it's like, inside. She imagined small high windows in a cliff face of brick, and thought perhaps she did, the way people imagined the different torments of hell. She shook her head faintly. To steady herself, she was trying to concentrate on the details of his transformation. The impression of added height was due to his parade-ground posture. No Cambridge student ever stood so straight. Even in his distraction, his shoulders were well back, and his chin was raised like an old-fashioned boxer? No, of course you don't. And when I was inside, did that give you pleasure? No, but you did nothing. She had thought about this conversation many times, like a child anticipating a beating. Now it was happening at last, and it was as if she wasn't quite here. She was watching from far away, and she was numb. But she knew his words would hurt her later. Cecilia had stood back. Now she put her hand again on Robbie's arm. He'd lost weight, though he looked stronger, with a lean and stringy muscular ferocity. He half turned to her. Remember, 
Cecilia was starting to say, but he spoke over her. Do you think I assaulted your cousin? No. Did you think it then? She fumbled her words. Yes, yes and no. I, I wasn't certain. And what's made you so certain now? She hesitated, conscious that in answering she would be offering a form of defence, a rationale, and that it might enrage him further. Growing up. He stared at her, lips slightly parted. He really had changed in five years. The hardness in his gaze was new, and the eyes were smaller and narrower, and in the corners were the firm prints of crow's feet. His face was thinner than she remembered. The cheeks were sunken like an Indian brave's. He'd grown a little toothbrush moustache in the military style. He was startlingly handsome, and they came back to her from years ago, when she was ten or eleven, the memory of a passion she'd had for him, a real crush that had lasted days. Then she confessed it to him one morning in the garden, and immediately forgot about it. She had been right to be wary. He was gripped by the kind of anger that passes itself off as wonderment. Growing up, he echoed. When he raised his voice, she jumped. God damn it, you're eighteen! How much growing up do you need to do? There are soldiers dying in the field at eighteen, old enough to be left to die on the roads. Did you know that? Yes. It was a pathetic source of comfort that he could not know what she had seen. Strange that for all her guilt, she should feel the need to withstand him. It was that, or be annihilated. She barely nodded. She didn't dare speak. At the mention of dying... A surge of feeling had engulfed him, pushing him beyond anger into an extremity of bewilderment and disgust. His breathing was irregular and heavy. He clenched and unclenched his right fist, and still he stared at her, into her, with a rigidity, a savagery in his look. His eyes were bright, and he swallowed hard several times. The muscles in his throat tensed and knotted. He, too, was fighting off an emotion he did not want witnessed. She learned the little she knew, the tiny, next to nothing scraps that came the way of a trainee nurse, in the safety of the ward and the bedside. She knew enough to recognise that memories were crowding in, and there was nothing he could do. They wouldn't let him speak. She would never know what scenes were driving this turmoil. He took a step towards her, and she shrank back, no longer certain of his harmlessness. If he couldn't talk, he might have to act. Another step, and he could have reached her with his sinewy arm. But Cecilia slid between them. With her back to Bryony, she faced Robbie and placed her hands on his shoulders. He turned his face away from her. Look at me, she murmured. Robbie, look at me. The reply he made was lost to Bryony. She heard his dissent or denial. Perhaps it was an obscenity. As Cecilia gripped him tighter, he twisted his whole body away from her, and they seemed like wrestlers as she reached up and tried to turn his head towards her. But his face was tilted back his lips retracted and teeth bared in a ghoulish parody of a smile. Now, with two hands, she was gripping his cheeks tightly, and with an effort she turned his face and drew it towards her own. At last he was looking into her eyes, but still she kept her grip on his cheeks. She pulled him closer, drawing him into her gaze, until their faces met, and she kissed him lightly, lingeringly on the lips. With a tenderness that Bryony remembered from years ago, waking in the night, Cecilia said, Come back, Robbie. Come back. He nodded faintly and took a deep breath, which he released slowly as she relaxed her grip and withdrew her hands from his face. In the silence, the room appeared to shrink even smaller. He put his arms around her, lowered his head and kissed her, a deep, sustained and private kiss. Bryony moved away quietly to the other end of the room, towards the window. While she drank a glass of water from the kitchen tap, the kiss continued, binding the couple into their solitude. She felt obliterated, expunged from the room, and was relieved. She turned her back and looked out at the quiet terraced houses in full sunlight, at the way she'd come from the high street. She was surprised to discover that she had no wish to leave yet, even though she was embarrassed by the long kiss, and dreaded what more there was to come. She watched an old woman dressed in a heavy overcoat, despite the heat. She was on the far pavement, walking an ailing, swag-bellied dachshund on a lead. Cecilia and Robbie were talking in low voices now, and Bryony decided that to respect their privacy, she would not turn from the window until she was spoken to. It was soothing, 
to watch the woman unfasten her front gate, close it carefully behind her with fussy exactitude, and then, halfway to her front door, bend with difficulty to pull up a weed from the narrow bed that ran the length of her front path. As she did so, the dog waddled forwards and licked her wrist. The lady and her dog went indoors, and the street was empty again. A blackbird dropped down onto a privet hedge, and finding no satisfactory foothold, flew away. The shadow of a cloud came and swiftly dimmed the light and passed on. It could be any Saturday afternoon. There was little evidence of a war in this suburban street. A glimpse of black outlines in a window across the way, the Ford 8 on its blocks, perhaps. Bryony heard her sister say her name and turned round. There isn't much time. Robbie has to report for duty at six tonight, and he's got a train to catch. So sit down. There are some things you're going to do for us. It was the ward sister's voice. Not even bossy. She simply described the inevitable. Bryony took the chair nearest her. Robbie brought over a stool, and Cecilia sat between them. The breakfast she had prepared was forgotten. The three empty cups stood in the centre of the table. He lifted the pile of books to the floor, as Cecilia moved the jam jar of harebells to one side where it could not be knocked over, she exchanged a look with Robbie. He was staring at the flowers as he cleared his throat. When he began to speak, his voice was purged of emotion. He could have been reading from a set of standing orders. He was looking at her now. His eyes were steady and he had everything under control. But there were drops of sweat on his forehead above his eyebrows. The most important thing you've already agreed to. You're to go to your parents as soon as you can and tell them everything they need to know to be convinced that your evidence was false. When's your day off? Sunday week. That's when you'll go. You'll take our addresses and you'll tell Jack and Emily that Cecilia is waiting to hear from them. The second thing you'll do tomorrow. Cecilia says you'll have an hour at some point. You'll go to a solicitor, a commissioner for oaths, and make a statement which will be signed and witnessed. In it, you'll say what you did wrong and how you're retracting your evidence. You'll send copies to both of us, is that clear? Yes. Then you'll write to me in much greater detail. In this letter, you'll put in absolutely everything you think is relevant, everything that led up to you saying you saw me by the lake, and why, even though you were uncertain, you stuck to your story in the months leading up to my trial. If there were pressures on you from the police or your parents, I want to know. Have you got that? It needs to be a long letter. Yes. He met Cecilia's look and nodded. And if you can remember anything at all about Danny Hardman, where he was, what he was doing, at what time, who else saw him, anything that might put his alibi in question, then we want to hear it. Cecilia was writing out the addresses. Bryony was shaking her head and starting to speak, but Robbie ignored her and spoke over her. He'd got to his feet and was looking at his watch. There's very little time. We're going to walk you to the tube. Cecilia and I want the last hour together alone before I have to leave, and you'll need to spend the rest of today writing your statement and letting your parents know you're coming, and you could start thinking about this letter you're sending me. With this brittle pracy of her obligations, he left the table and went towards the bedroom. Bryony stood too and said... Old Hardman was probably telling the truth. Danny was with him all that night. Cecilia was about to pass the folded sheet of paper she'd been writing on. Robbie had stopped in the bedroom doorway. Cecilia said, What do you mean by that? What are you saying? It was Paul Marshall. During the silence that followed, Bryony tried to imagine the adjustments that each would be making. Years of seeing it a certain way. And yet, however startling, it was only a detail. Nothing essential was changed by it, nothing in her own role. Robbie came back to the table. Marshall? Yes. You saw him? I saw a man his height. My height? Yes. Cecilia now stood and looked around her. A hunt for the cigarettes was about to start. Robbie found them and tossed the packet across the room. Cecilia lit up and said as she exhaled, I find it difficult to believe. He's a fool, I know. He's a greedy fool, Robbie said. But I can't imagine him with Lola Quincy. Even for the five minutes it took, 
Given all that had happened and all its terrible consequences, it was frivolous, she knew, but Bryony took calm pleasure in delivering her clinching news. I've just come from their wedding. Again, the amazed adjustments, the incredulous repetition. Wedding? This morning? Clapham? Then reflective silence, broken by single remarks. I want to find him. You do no such thing. I want to kill him. And then, it's time to go. There was so much more that could have been said, but they seemed exhausted by her presence or by the subject, or they simply longed to be alone. Either way, it was clear they felt their meeting was at an end. All curiosity was spent. Everything could wait until she wrote her letter. Robbie fetched his jacket and cap from the bedroom. Bryony noted the corporal's single stripe. Cecilia was saying to him, He's immune. She'll always cover for him. Minutes were lost while she searched for her ration book. Finally, she gave up and said to Robbie, I'm sure it's in Wiltshire, in the cottage. As they were about to leave and he was holding the door open for the sisters, Robbie said, I suppose we owe an apology to Abel Seaman Hardman. Downstairs, Mrs. Jarvis did not appear from her sitting room as they went by. They heard clarinets playing on her wireless. Once through the front door, it seemed to Bryony that she was stepping into another day. There was a strong, gritty breeze blowing, and the street was in harsh relief, with even more sunlight, fewer shadows than before. There was not enough room on the pavement to go three abreast. Robbie and Cecilia walked behind her, hand in hand. Bryony felt her blistered heel rubbing against her shoe, but she was determined they should not see her limp. She had the impression of being seen off the premises. At one point she turned and told them she would be happy to walk to the tube on her own, but they insisted. They had purchases to make for Robbie's journey. They walked on in silence. Small talk was not an option. She knew that she did not have the right to ask her sister about her new address, or Robbie where the train was taking him, or about the cottage in Wiltshire. Was that where the harebells came from? Surely there had been an idyll. Nor could she ask when the two of them would see each other again. Together, she and her sister and Robbie had only one subject, and it was fixed in the unchangeable past. They stood outside Ballam Tube Station, which in three months' time would achieve its terrible form of fame in the Blitz. A thin stream of Saturday shoppers moved around them, causing them, against their will, to stand closer. They made a cool farewell. Robbie reminded her to have money with her when she saw the Commissioner for Oaths, Cecilia told her she was not to forget to take the addresses with her to Surrey. Then it was over. They stared at her, waiting for her to leave. But there was one thing she had not said. She spoke slowly. I'm very, very sorry. I've caused you such terrible distress. They continued to stare at her, and she repeated herself. I'm very sorry. It sounded so foolish and inadequate, as though she'd knocked over a favourite houseplant or forgotten a birthday. Robbie said softly, Just do all the things we've asked. It was almost conciliatory, that just, but not quite, not yet. She said, Of course, and then turned and walked away, conscious of them watching her as she entered the ticket hall and crossed it. She paid her fare to Waterloo. When she reached the barrier, she looked back, and they had gone. She showed her ticket and went through into the dirty yellow light to the head of the clanking, creaking escalator, and it began to take her down into the man-made breeze rising from the blackness, the breath of a million Londoners cooling her face and tugging at her cape. She stood still and let herself be carried down, grateful to be moving without scouring her heel. She was surprised at how serene she felt, and just a little sad. Was it disappointment? She'd hardly expected to be forgiven. What she felt was more like homesickness, though there was no source for it, no home. But she was sad to leave her sister. It was her sister she missed, or more precisely, it was her sister with Robbie, their love. Neither Bryony nor the war had destroyed it. This was what soothed her as she sank deeper under the city.
how Cecilia had drawn him to her with her eyes, that tenderness in her voice when she called him back from his memories, from Dunkirk, or from the roads that led to it. She used to speak like that to her sometimes, when Cecilia was sixteen and she was a child of six and things went impossibly wrong, or in the night when Cecilia came to rescue her from a nightmare and take her into her own bed. Those were the words she used. Come back. It was only a bad dream. Briony, come back. How easily this unthinking family love was forgotten. She was gliding down now through the soupy brown light almost to the bottom. There were no other passengers in sight, and the air was suddenly still. She was calm as she considered what she had to do. Together, the note to her parents and the formal statement would take no time at all. Then she would be free for the rest of the day. She knew what was required of her. Not simply a letter, but a new draft. An atonement. And she was ready to begin. B.T. London, 1999 London, 1999. What a strange time this has been. Today, on the morning of my 77th birthday, I decided to make one last visit to the Imperial War Museum Library in Lambeth. It suited my peculiar state of mind. The reading room, housed right up in the dome of the building, was formerly the chapel of the Royal Bethlehem Hospital, the Old Bedlam. Where the unhinged once came to offer their prayers... Scholars now gather to research the collective insanity of war. The car the family was sending was not due until after lunch, so I thought I would distract myself, checking final details and saying my farewells to the keeper of documents and to the cheerful porters who have been escorting me up and down in the lift during these wintry weeks. I also intended to donate to the archives my dozen long letters from old Mr Nettle. It was a birthday present to myself, I suppose, to pass an hour or two in a half-pretense of seeming busy, fussing about with those little tasks of housekeeping that come at the end and are part of the reluctant process of letting go. In the same mood I was busy in my study yesterday afternoon. Now the drafts are in order and dated, the photocopied sources labelled, the borrowed books ready for return, and everything is in the right box file. I've always liked to make a tidy finish. It was too cold and wet, and I was feeling too troubled to go by public transport. I took a taxi from Regent's Park, and in the long crawl through central London, I thought of those sad inmates of Bedlam, who were once a source of general entertainment, and I reflected, in a self-pitying way, on how I was soon to join their ranks. The results of my scan have come through and I went to see my doctor about them yesterday morning. It was not good news. This was the way he put it as soon as I sat down. My headaches, the sensation of tightness around the temples, have a particular and sinister cause. He pointed out some granular smears across a section of the scan. I noticed how the pencil tip quivered in his hand, and I wondered if he too was suffering some neural disorder. In the spirit of shoot the messenger, I rather hoped he was. I was experiencing, he said, a series of tiny, nearly imperceptible strokes. The process will be slow, but my brain, my mind, is closing down. The little failures of memory that dog us all beyond a certain point will become more noticeable, more debilitating. Until the time will come when I won't notice them, because I will have lost the ability to comprehend anything at all. The days of the week, the events of the morning, or even ten minutes ago, will be beyond my reach. My phone number, my address, my name, and what I did with my life will be gone. In two, three, or four years' time, I will not recognize my remaining oldest friends, and when I wake in the morning, I will not recognize that I am in my own room, and soon I won't be because I will need continuous care. I have vascular dementia, the doctor told me, and there was some comfort to be had. There's the slowness of the undoing, which he must have mentioned a dozen times. Also, it's not as bad as Alzheimer's, with its mood swings and aggression. If I'm lucky, it might turn out to be somewhat benign.
I might not be unhappy, just a dim old biddy in a chair, knowing nothing, expecting nothing. I had asked him to be frank, so I could not complain. Now he was hurrying me out. There were twelve people in his waiting room wanting their turn. In summary, as he helped me into my coat, he gave me the route map. Loss of memory, short and long term. The disappearance of single words, simple nouns might be the first to go. Then language itself, along with balance. And soon after, all motor control. And finally, the autonomous nervous system. Bon voyage. I wasn't distressed, not at first. On the contrary, I was elated and urgently wanted to tell my closest friends. I spent an hour on the phone, breaking my news. Perhaps I was already losing my grip. It seemed so momentous. All afternoon I potted about in my study with my housekeeping chores, and by the time I finished there were six new box files on the shelves. Stella and John came over in the evening, and we ordered in some Chinese food. Between them they drank two bottles of Morgan. I drank green tea. My charming friends were devastated by my description of my future. They're both in their sixties, old enough to start fooling themselves that seventy-seven is still young. Today, in the taxi, as I crossed London at walking pace in the freezing rain, I thought of little else. I'm going mad, I told myself. Let me not be mad. But I couldn't really believe it. Perhaps I was nothing more than a victim of modern diagnostics. In another century, it would have been said of me that I was old and therefore losing my mind. What else would I expect? I'm only dying, then. I'm fading into unknowing. My taxi was cutting through the back streets of Bloomsbury, past the house where my father lived after his second marriage, and past the basement flat where I lived and worked all through the fifties. Beyond a certain age, a journey across the city becomes uncomfortably reflective. The addresses of the dead pile up. We crossed the square where Leon heroically nursed his wife, and then raised his boisterous children with a devotion that amazed us all. One day I, too, will prompt a moment's reflection in the passenger of a passing cab. It's a popular shortcut, the inner circle of Regent's Park. We crossed the river at Waterloo Bridge. I sat forward on the edge of my seat to take in my favourite view of the city. And as I turned my neck, downstream to St Paul's, upstream to Big Ben, the full panoply of tourist London in between, I felt myself to be physically well and mentally intact, give or take the headaches and a little tiredness. However withered, I still feel myself to be exactly the same person I've always been. Hard to explain that to the young. We may look truly reptilian, but we're not a separate tribe. In the next year or two, however, I will be losing my claim to this familiar protestation. The seriously ill, the deranged, are another race. An inferior race. I won't let anyone persuade me otherwise. My cabbie was cursing. Over the river, roadworks were forcing us on a detour towards the old county hall. As we swung off the roundabout there towards Lambeth, I had a glimpse of St Thomas's Hospital. It took a clobbering in the Blitz. I wasn't there, thank God. And the replacement buildings and the tower block are a national disgrace. I worked in three hospitals in the duration— Alder Hay and the Royal East Sussex, as well as St. Thomas's, and I merged them in my description to concentrate all my experiences into one place, a convenient distortion, and the least of my offences against veracity. It was raining less heavily as the driver made a neat U-turn in the middle of the road to bring us outside the main gates of the museum. With the business of gathering up my bag, finding a twenty-pound note and unfolding my umbrella, I did not notice the car parked immediately in front until my cab pulled away. It was a black rose. For a moment I thought it was unattended. In fact, the chauffeur was a diminutive fellow, almost lost behind the front wheel. I am not sure that what I am about to describe really rates as a startling coincidence. I occasionally think of the marshals whenever I see a parked rose without a driver. It's become a habit over the years. They often pass through my mind, usually without generating any particular feeling. I've grown used to the idea of them. They still appear in the newspapers occasionally, in connection with their foundation and all its good work for medical research, or the collection they've donated to the Tate, or their generous funding of agricultural projects in sub-Saharan Africa.
and her parties and their vigorous libel actions against national newspapers, it was not remarkable that Lord and Lady Marshall passed through my thoughts as I approached those massive twin guns in front of the museum. But it was a shock to see them coming down the steps towards me. A posse of officials, I recognised the museum's director, and a single photographer made up a farewell party. Two young men held umbrellas over the marshal's heads as they descended the steps by the columns. I held back, slowing my pace rather than stopping and drawing attention to myself. There was a round of handshakes and a chorus of genial laughter at something Lord Marshall said. He leaned on a walking stick, the lacquered cane that I think has become something of a trademark. He and his wife and the director posed for the camera. Then the marshals came away, accompanied by the suited young men with the umbrellas. The museum officials remained on the steps. My concern was to see which way the marshals would go so that I could avoid a head-on encounter. They chose to pass the guns on their left, so I did the same. Concealed partly by the raised barrels and their concrete emplacements, partly by my tilted umbrella, I kept hidden but still managed a good look. They went by in silence. He was familiar from his photographs. Despite the liver spots and the purplish swags under his eyes, he at last appeared the cruelly handsome plutocrat, though somewhat reduced. Age had shrunk his face and delivered the look he had always fallen short of by a fraction. It was his jaw that had scaled itself down. Bone loss had been kind. He was a little doddery and flat-footed, but he walked reasonably well for a man of eighty-eight. One becomes a judge of these things but his hand was firmly on her arm, and the stick was not just for show. It has often been remarked upon how much good he did in the world. Perhaps he spent a lifetime making amends. Or perhaps he just swept onwards without a thought to live the life that was always his. As for Lola, my high-living, chain-smoking cousin, here she was, still as lean and fit as a racing dog, and still faithful. Who would have dreamed it? This, as they used to say, was the side on which her bread was buttered. That may sound sour, but it went through my mind as I glanced across at her. She wore a sable coat and a scarlet, wide-brimmed fedora, bold rather than vulgar. Near on eighty years old and still wearing high heels, they clicked on the pavement with the sound of a younger woman's stride. There was no sign of a cigarette. In fact, there was an air of the health farm about her and an indoor tan. She was taller than her husband now, and there was no doubting her vigour, but there was also something comic about her. Oh, was I clutching at straws? She was heavy on the make-up, quite garish around the mouth, and liberal with the smoothing cream and powder. I've always been a Puritan in this, so I count myself an unreliable witness. I thought there was a touch of the stage villain here, the gaunt figure, the black coat, the lurid lips... A cigarette holder, a lapdog tucked under one arm, and she could have been Cruella de Vil. We passed by each other in a matter of seconds. I went on up the steps, then stopped under the pediment out of the rain to watch the group make its way to the car. He was helped in first, and I saw then how frail he was. He couldn't bend at the waist, nor could he take his own weight on one foot. They had to lift him into his seat. The far door was held open for Lady Lola, who folded herself in with a terrible agility. I watched the rolls pull away into the traffic. Then I went in. Seeing them laid something heavy on my heart, and I was trying not to think about it, or feel it now. I already had enough to deal with today. But Lola's health was on my mind as I gave my bag in at the cloakroom and exchanged cheery good mornings with the porters. The rule here is that one must be escorted up to the reading room in a lift, whose cramped space makes small talk compulsory as far as I am concerned. As I made it, shocking weather, but improvements were due by the weekend, I couldn't resist thinking about my encounter outside in the fundamental terms of health. I might outlive Paul Marshall, but Lola would certainly outlive me. The consequences of this are clear. The issue has been with us for years. As my editor put it once, publication equals litigation. But I could hardly face that now. There was already enough that I didn't want to be thinking about. I'd come here to be busy, 
I spent a while chatting with the keeper of documents. I handed over the bundle of letters Mr. Nettle wrote me about Dunkirk, most gratefully received. They'll be stored with all the others I've given. The keeper had found me an obliging old colonel of the Buffs, something of an amateur historian himself, who had read the relevant pages of my typescript and faxed through his suggestions. His notes were handed to me now, irascible, helpful. I was completely absorbed by them, thank God. Absolutely no, underlined twice. Soldier serving with the British Army would say on the double. Only an American would give such an order. The correct term is at the double. I love these little things, this pointillist approach to verisimilitude, the correction of detail that cumulatively gives such satisfaction. No one would ever think of saying 25 pound guns. The term was either 25 pounders or 25 pounder guns. Your usage would sound distinctly bizarre, even to a man who was not with the Royal Artillery. Like policemen in a search team, we go on hands and knees and crawl our way towards the truth. You have your RAF chappy wearing a beret. I really don't think so. Outside the tank corps, even the army didn't have them in 1940. I think you'd better give the man a forage cap. Finally, the colonel, who began his letter by addressing me as Miss Tallis, allowed some impatience with my sex to show through. What was our kind doing anyway, meddling in these affairs? Madam, underlined three times, a Stuka does not carry a single thousand-ton bomb. Are you aware that a Navy frigate hardly weighs that much? I suggest you look into the matter further. Merely a typo. I meant to type pound. I made a note of these corrections and wrote a letter of thanks to the colonel. I paid for some photocopies of documents, which I arranged into orderly piles for my own archives. I returned the books I had been using to the front desk and threw away various scraps of paper. The workspace was cleared of all traces of me. As I said my goodbyes to the keeper, I learned that the Marshall Foundation was about to make a grant to the museum. After a round of handshaking with the other librarians and my promise to acknowledge the department's help, a porter was called to see me down. Very kindly, the girl in the cloakroom called a taxi and one of the younger members of the door staff carried my bag all the way out to the pavement. During the ride back north, I thought about the colonel's letter, or rather about my own pleasure in these trivial alterations. If I really cared so much about facts... I should have written a different kind of book. But my work was done. There would be no further drafts. These were the thoughts I had as we entered the old tram tunnel under the Aldwych, just before I fell asleep. When I was woken by the driver, the cab was outside my flat in Regent's Park. I filed away the papers I had brought from the library, made a sandwich, then packed an overnight case. I was conscious as I moved about my flat from one familiar room to another that the years of my independence could soon be over. On my desk was a framed photograph of my husband, Thierry, taken in Marseille two years before he died. One day I would be asking who he was. I soothed myself by spending time choosing a dress to wear for my birthday dinner. The process was actually rejuvenating. I'm thinner than I was a year ago. As I trailed my fingers along the racks, I forgot about the diagnosis for minutes on end. I decided on a shirt-waisted cashmere dress in dove grey. Everything followed easily then. A white satin scarf held by Emily's cameo brooch, patent court shoes, low-heeled, of course, a black devore shawl. I closed the case and was surprised by how light it seemed as I carried it into the hallway. My secretary would be coming in tomorrow before I returned. I left her a note setting out the work I wanted her to do. Then I took a book and a cup of tea and sat in an armchair at a window with a view over the park. I've always been good at not thinking about the things that are really troubling me. But I was not able to read. I felt excited. A journey into the country, a dinner in my honour, a renewal of family bonds and yet I'd had one of those classic conversations with a doctor. I should have been depressed. Was it possible that I was, in the modern term, in denial? Thinking this changed nothing. 
The car was not due for another half hour, and I was restless. I got out of the chair and went up and down the room a few times. My knees hurt if I sit too long. I was haunted by the thought of Lola, the severity of that gaunt old painted face, her boldness of stride in the perilous high heels, her vitality ducking into the rolls. Was I competing with her as I trod the carpet between the fireplace and the Chesterfield? I always thought the high life, the cigarettes, would see her off. Even in our fifties I thought that. But at eighty she has a voracious, knowing look. She was always the superior older girl, one step ahead of me. But in that final, important matter, I will be ahead of her, while she live on to be a hundred. I will not be able to publish in my lifetime. The rolls must have turned my head, because the car, when it came, fifteen minutes late, was a disappointment. Such things do not usually trouble me. It was a dusty minicab, whose rear seat was covered in nylon fur with a zebra pattern. But the driver, Michael, was a cheerful West Indian lad who took my case and made a fuss of sliding the front passenger seat forwards for me. Once it was established that I would not tolerate the thumping music at any volume from the speakers on the ledge behind my head, and he had recovered from a little sulkiness, we got along well and talked about families. He'd never known his father, and his mother was a doctor at the Middlesex Hospital. He himself graduated in law from Leicester University, and now he was going to the LSE to write a doctoral thesis on law and poverty in the Third World. As we headed out of London by the dismal Westway, he gave me his condensed version, no property law, therefore no capital, therefore no wealth. There's a lawyer talking, I said, drumming up business for yourself. He laughed politely, though he must have thought me profoundly stupid. It is quite impossible these days to assume anything about people's educational level from the way they talk or dress, or from their taste in music. Safest to treat everyone you meet as a distinguished intellectual. After twenty minutes, we'd spoken enough, and as the car reached a motorway and the engine settled into an unvarying drone, I fell asleep again, and when I woke, we were on a country road, and a painful tightness was around my forehead. I took from my handbag three aspirins, which I chewed and swallowed with distaste. Which portion of my mind, of my memory, had I lost to a minuscule stroke while I was asleep? I would never know. It was then, in the back of that tinny little car, that I experienced for the first time something like desperation. Panic would be too strong a word. Claustrophobia was part of it, helpless confinement within a process of decay and a sensation of shrinking. I tapped Michael's shoulder and asked him to turn on his music. He assumed I was indulging him because we were close to our destination, and he refused. But I insisted, and so the thumping, twangy bass noise resumed, and over it a light baritone chanting in Caribbean patois to the rhythms of a nursery rhyme, or a playground skipping rope jingle. It helped me, it amused me. It sounded so childish, though I had a suspicion that some terrible sentiments were being expressed. I didn't ask for a translation. The music was still playing as we turned into the drive of Tilney's Hotel. More than twenty-five years had passed since I came this way, for Emily's funeral. I noticed first the absence of parkland trees, the giant elms lost to disease, I supposed, and the remaining oaks cleared to make way for a golf course. We were slowing now to let some golfers and their caddies cross. I couldn't help thinking of them as trespassers. The woods that surrounded Grace Turner's old bungalow were still there, and as the drive cleared a last stand of beaches, the main house came into view. There was no need to be nostalgic. It was always an ugly place. But from a distance, it had a stark and unprotected look. The ivy, which used to soften the effect of that bright red facade, had been stripped away, perhaps to preserve the brickwork. Soon we were approaching the first bridge, and already I could see that the lake was no longer there. On the bridge we were suspended above an area of perfect lawn, such as you sometimes see in an old moat. It was not unpleasant in itself, if you did not know what had once been there. The sedge, the ducks, and the giant carp that two tramps had roasted and feasted on by the island temple. 
which had also gone. Where it stood was a wooden bench and a litter basket. The island, which of course was no longer that, was a long mound of smooth grass, like an immense ancient barrow, where rhododendrons and other shrubbery were growing. There was a gravel path looping round with more benches here and there, and spherical garden lights. I did not have time to try and estimate the spot where I once sat and comforted the young Lady Lola Marshall, for we were already crossing the second bridge, and then slowing to turn into the asphalted car park that ran the length of the house. Michael carried my case into the reception area in the old hall. How odd that they should have taken the trouble to lay needle-cord carpet over those black and white tiles. I suppose that the acoustic was always troublesome, though I never minded it. A Vivaldi season was burbling through concealed speakers. There was a decent rosewood desk with a computer screen and a vase of flowers, and standing guard on each side were two suits of armour, mounted on the panelling, crossed halberds and a coat of arms. Above them, the portrait that used to be in the dining room, which my grandfather imported to give the family some lineage. I tipped Michael and earnestly wished him luck with property rights and poverty. I was trying to unsay my foolish remark about lawyers. He wished me happy birthday and shook my hand. How feathery and unassertive his grip was. And left. From behind the desk, a grave-faced girl in a business suit gave me my key and told me that the old library had been booked for the exclusive use of our party. The few who had already arrived had gone out for a stroll. The plan was to gather for drinks at six. A porter would bring my case up. There was a lift for my convenience. No one to greet me then. But I was relieved. I preferred to take it in alone, the interest of so much change, before I was obliged to become the guest of honour. I took the lift to the second floor, went through a set of glass fire doors and walked along the corridor whose polished boards creaked in a familiar way. It was bizarre to see the bedrooms numbered and locked. Of course, my room number, seven, told me nothing. But I think I'd already guessed where I would be sleeping. At least, when I stopped outside the door, I wasn't surprised. Not my old room. But Auntie Venus's, always considered to have the best view in the house, over the lake, the driveway, the woods, and the hills beyond. Charles, Piero's grandson, and the organising spirit would have reserved it for me. It was a pleasant surprise stepping in. Rooms on either side had been incorporated to make a grand suite. On a low glass table stood a giant spray of hothouse flowers. The huge high bed Auntie Venus had occupied for so long without complaint had gone, and so had the carved trousseau chest and the green silk sofa. They were now the property of the eldest son by Leon's second marriage, and installed in a castle somewhere in the Scottish Highlands. But the new furnishings were fine, and I liked my room. My case arrived. I ordered a pot of tea and hung my dress. I explored my sitting room, which had a writing desk and a good lamp, and was impressed by the vastness of the bathroom with its potpourri and stacks of towels on a heated rack. It was a relief not to see everything in terms of tasteless decline. It easily becomes a habit of age. I stood at the window to admire the sunlight slanting over the golf course and burnishing the bare trees on the distant hills. I could not quite accept the absence of the lake, but it could be restored one day, perhaps and the building itself surely embraced more human happiness now as a hotel than it did when I lived here. Charles phoned an hour later, just as I was beginning to think about getting dressed. He suggested that he came to get me at 6.15, after everyone else was gathered, and bring me down so that I could make an entrance. And so it was that I entered that enormous L-shaped room, on his arm, in my cashmere finery, to the applause and then the raised glasses of fifty relatives. My immediate impression as I came in was of recognising no one, not a familiar face. I wondered if this was a foretaste of the incomprehension I'd been promised. Then, slowly, people came into focus. I must make allowances for the years and the speed with which babes in arms become boisterous ten-year-olds. There was no mistaking my brother, curled and slumped to one side in his wheelchair, a napkin at his throat to catch the spills of champagne that someone held to his lips. As I leaned over to kiss Leon, 
he managed a smile in the half of his face still under his control. And nor did I mistake for long Piero, much shriveled and with a shining pate I wanted to put my hand on, but still twinkly as ever and very much the paterfamilias. It's accepted that we never mention his sister. I made a progress round the room with Charles at my side, prompting me with the names. How delightful to be at the heart of such a goodwill reunion. I reacquainted myself with the children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Jackson, who died fifteen years ago. In fact, between them, the twins had fairly peopled the room. And Leon had not done so badly either, with his four marriages and dedicated fathering. We ranged in age from three months to his eighty-nine years. And what a din of voices from gruff to shrill as the waiters came round with more champagne and lemonade. The ageing children of distant cousins greeted me like long-lost friends. Every second person wanted to tell me something kind about my books. A group of enchanting teenagers told me how they were studying my books at school. I promised to read the typescript novel of someone's absent son. Notes and cards were pressed into my hands. Piled on a table in the corner of the room were presents which I would have to open, several children told me, before, not after, their bedtime. I made my promises. I shook hands, kissed cheeks and lips, admired and tickled babies. And just as I was beginning to think how much I wanted to sit down somewhere, I noticed that chairs were being set out, facing one way. Then Charles clapped his hands and, shouting over the noise that barely subsided, announced that before dinner there was to be an entertainment in my honour. Would we all take our seats? I was led to an armchair in the front row. Next to me was old Piero, who was in conversation with a cousin on his left. A fidgety, near silence descended on the room. From a corner came the agitated whispers of children, which I thought it tactful to ignore. While we waited, while I had, as it were, some seconds to myself, I looked about me, and only now properly absorbed the fact that all the books were gone from the library, and all the shelves too. That was why the room had seemed so much bigger than I remembered. The only reading matter was the country magazines in racks by the fireplace. At the sound of shushing and the scrape of a chair, there stood before us a boy with a black cloak over his shoulders. He was pale, freckled, and ginger-haired, no mistaking a Quincy child. I guessed him to be about nine or ten years old. His body was frail, which made his head seem large and gave him an ethereal look, but he looked confident as he gazed around the room, waiting for his audience to settle. Then, at last, he raised his elfin chin, filled his lungs, and spoke out in a clear, pure treble. I'd been expecting a magic trick, but what I heard had the ring of the supernatural. This is the tale of spontaneous Arabella, who ran off with an extrinsic fella. It grieved her parents to see their firstborn, Everness, from her home to go to Eastbourne, without permission to get ill and find indigence until she was down to her last sixpence. Suddenly, she was right there before me, that busy, priggish, conceited little girl, and she was not dead either, for when people tittered appreciatively at Everness, my feeble heart, ridiculous vanity, made a little leap. The boy recited with a thrilling clarity and a jarring touch of what my generation would call cockney, though I have no idea these days what the significance is of a glottal tea. I knew the words were mine, but I barely remembered them, and it was hard to concentrate with so many questions, so much feeling crowding in. Where had they found the copy? And was this unearthly confidence a symptom of a different age? I glanced at my neighbour, Piero. He had his handkerchief out and was dabbing at his eyes, and I don't think it was only great-grandfatherly pride. I also suspected that this was all his idea. The prologue rose to its reasonable climax. For that fortuitous girl, the sweet day dawned to wed her gorgeous prince, but be warned, because Arabella almost learned too late that before we love, we must cogitate. We made a rowdy applause. There was even some vulgar whistling. That dictionary, that Oxford concise, where was it now? 
northwest Scotland. I wanted it back. The boy made a bow and retreated a couple of yards, and was joined by four other children who had come up unnoticed by me and were waiting in what would have been the wings. And so the trials of Arabella began, with a leave-taking from the anxious, saddened parents. I recognised the heroine immediately as Leon's great-granddaughter, Chloe. What a lovely, solemn girl she is, with her rich, low voice and her mother's Spanish blood. I remember being at her first birthday party, and it seemed only months ago. I watched her fall convincingly into poverty and despair, once abandoned by the wicked Count, who was the prologue speaker in his black cloak. In less than ten minutes it was over. In memory, distorted by a child's sense of time, it had always seemed the length of a Shakespeare play. I had completely forgotten that after the wedding ceremony, Arabella and the medical prince link arms and, speaking in unison, step forwards to address to the audience a final couplet. Here's the beginning of love at the end of our travail. So farewell, kind friends, as into the sunset we sail. Not my best, I thought. But the whole room, except for Leon, Piero and myself, rose for the applause. How practised these children were, right down to the curtain call. Hand in hand they stood in line, abreast, taking their cue from Chloe, stepped back two paces, came forwards, bowed again. In the uproar, no one noticed that poor Piero was completely overcome and put his face in his hands. Was he reliving that lonely, terrifying time here after his parents' divorce? They'd so much wanted to be in the play, the twins, for that evening in the library. And here it was, at last, sixty-four years late, and his brother long dead. I was helped out of my comfortable chair and made a little speech of thanks. Competing with a wailing baby at the back of the room, I tried to evoke that hot summer of 1935, when the cousins came down from the north. I turned to the cast and told them that our production would have been no match for theirs. Piero was nodding emphatically. I explained that it was entirely my fault the rehearsals fell apart, because halfway through I had decided to become a novelist. There was indulgent laughter. More applause. Then Charles announced that it was dinner. And so the pleasant evening unravelled, the noisy meal at which I even drank a little wine, the presents, bedtime for the younger children, while their bigger brothers and sisters went off to watch television. Then speeches over coffee and much good-natured laughter, and by ten o'clock I was beginning to think of my splendid room upstairs, not because I was tired, but because I was tired of being in company and the object of so much attention, however kindly. Another half hour passed in good nights and farewells before Charles and his wife Annie escorted me to my room. Now it is five in the morning, and I am still at the writing desk, thinking over my strange two days. It's true about the old not needing sleep, at least not in the night. I still have so much to consider, and soon, within the year perhaps, I'll have far less of a mind to do it with. I've been thinking about my last novel, the one that should have been my first. The earliest version, January 1940, the latest, March 1999, and in between half a dozen different drafts. The second draft, June 1947. The third, who cares to know? My 59-year assignment is over. There was our crime, Lola's, Marshall's, mine. And from the second version onwards, I set out to describe it. I regarded it as my duty to disguise nothing, the names, the places, the exact circumstances. I put it all there as a matter of historical record. But as a matter of legal reality, so various editors have told me over the years, my forensic memoir could never be published while my fellow criminals were alive. You may only libel yourself and the dead. The marshals have been active about the courts since the late forties, defending their good names with the most expensive ferocity, they could ruin a publishing house with ease from their current accounts. One might almost think they had something to hide. Think, yes, but not right. The obvious suggestions have been made. Displace, transmute, dissemble. Bring down the fogs of the imagination. What are novelists for? Go just so far as is necessary. Set up camp inches beyond the reach, the fingertips of the law.' 
But no one knows these precise distances until a judgment is handed down. To be safe, one would have to be bland and obscure. I know I cannot publish until they are dead. And as of this morning, I accept that will not be until I am. No good just one of them going. Even with Lord Marshall's bone-shrunk mug on the obituary pages at last, my cousin from the North would not tolerate an accusation of criminal conspiracy. There was a crime, but there were also the lovers. Lovers and their happy ends have been on my mind all night long, as into the sunset we sail an unhappy inversion. It occurs to me that I have not travelled so very far after all since I wrote my little play. Or rather, I've made a huge digression and doubled back to my starting place. It is only in this last version that my lovers end well, standing side by side on a South London pavement as I walk away. All the preceding drafts were pitiless. But now I can no longer think what purpose would be served if, say, I tried to persuade my reader, by direct or indirect means, that Robbie Turner died of septicemia at Bray Dunes on the 1st of June, 1940, or that Cecilia was killed in September of the same year by the bomb that destroyed Ballam Underground Station, that I never saw them in that year, that my walk across London ended at the church on Clapham Common, and that a cowardly Bryony limped back to the hospital, unable to confront her recently bereaved sister, that the letters the lovers wrote are in the archives of the War Museum, how could that constitute an ending? What sense or hope or satisfaction could a reader draw from such an account? Who would want to believe that they never met again, never fulfilled their love? Who would want to believe that, except in the service of the bleakest realism? I couldn't do it to them. I'm too old, too frightened, too much in love with the shred of life I have remaining. I face an incoming tide of forgetting, and then oblivion. I no longer possess the courage of my pessimism. When I am dead, and the marshals are dead, and the novel is finally published, we will only exist as my inventions. Bryony will be as much of a fantasy as the lovers who shared a bed in Balham and enraged their landlady. No one will care what events and which individuals were misrepresented to make a novel. I know there's always a certain kind of reader who will be compelled to ask, but what really happened? The answer is simple. The lovers survive and flourish. As long as there is a single copy, a solitary typescript of my final draft, then my spontaneous, fortuitous sister and her medical prince survive to love. The problem these fifty-nine years has been this. How can a novelist achieve atonement when with her absolute power of deciding outcomes she is also God? There is no one, no entity or higher form that she can appeal to or be reconciled with, or that can forgive her. There is nothing outside her. In her imagination, she has set the limits and the terms. No atonement for God, or novelists, even if they are atheists. It was always an impossible task. And that was precisely the point. The attempt was all. I've been standing at the window, feeling waves of tiredness beat the remaining strength from my body. The floor seems to be undulating beneath my feet. I've been watching the first grey light bring into view the park and the bridges over the vanished lake, and the long, narrow driveway down which they drove Robbie away, into the whiteness. I like to think that it isn't weakness or evasion but a final act of kindness, a stand against oblivion and despair, to let my lovers live and to unite them at the end. I gave them happiness, but I was not so self-serving as to let them forgive me. Not quite. Not yet. If I had the power to conjure them at my birthday celebration, Robbie and Cecilia, still alive, still in love, sitting side by side in the library, smiling at the trials of Arabella. It's not impossible. But now I must sleep. That was Atonement by Ian McEwan, read 
by Carol Boyd.